The Kalam cosmological argument for God's existence, as you probably know, runs as follows. Premise 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. Conclusion. So the universe has a cause. Today, we're doing a deep dive into premise one of the Kalam, which is the Kalam's causal principle. It says that whatever begins to exist has a cause. We're going to be asking, is it true? What are the arguments for it? And what are the arguments against it? We'll be exploring these questions and more in the first ever complete guide to assessing the Kalam's causal principle. Buckle up. Sup dogs, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today, as I said, we're doing an in-depth analysis and evaluation of the Kalam's causal principle. A quick comment before we get into the nitty-gritty details. First, keep in mind that there are different forms or versions of the Kalam. In my Kalam series with Stephen Woodford of Rationality Rules, we're breaking it up into the old Kalam versus the new Kalam. Today, we're focusing on the old Kalam, which is the one up here. It's the one championed by William Lane Craig. The new Kalam rests crucially on causal finitism, and if you're curious about what that is and how it's motivated, check out my Kalam playlist. Another note is that we're going to be focusing today only on stage one of the old Kalam, which is just this two-premise argument up here. The second stage of reasoning tries to identify this cause of the universe with God. It tries to argue that it has various significant divine attributes. A few shout-outs before we get going. Firstly, check out my Kalam playlist for absolutely everything pertaining to the Kalam, pertaining to Hilbert's Hotel, the successive edition argument, the new Kalam, causal finitism, Grim Reaper paradoxes, criticisms of stage two, and so on down the list. Another quick shout-out is that if you're curious, you can check out this paper that I just published in Philosophical Studies with Alex Malpass entitled Branching Actualism and Cosmological Arguments. Therein we talk about the Kalam, contingency arguments, and things like that. The paper is linked in the description for those curious. Also, patrons get access to this 47-page document. It's about 19,000 words. And they also get access to lots of other goodies, including exclusive access to videos, early access to videos, access to scripts of mine, discussion briefs, papers, books, things like that. So many cool goodies for patrons. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider becoming a patron or making a one-time donation. Links to those in the description. Okay, moving on to the structure of this video. So firstly, we need to understand what the causal principle is saying if we're going to evaluate it and assess it. Secondly, we're going to be looking at arguments for the causal principle. We're going to be looking at the argument from intuition, from induction, from abduction, from chaos, and an argument called the modus tollens argument. Thirdly, we're going to be looking at arguments against the causal principle. So reverse card, intuition, free will, conceivability, quantum mechanics, non-causal explanations, and Adolf Grunbaum's argument. And then we shall conclude. All right, so that's a bird's eye view of the structure of this video, and now we are getting on to understanding the causal principle. All right, so the causal principle, of course, says that whatever begins to exist has a cause. And there are three crucial terms here, existence, begins to exist, and cause. And we're going to proceed through each of these in turn. So existence is difficult to define. Uh, roughly, X exists just in case there is such a thing as X. Or X is in reality. The number of X's is greater than zero. If you had to write down a list of all the things that there are, X would be on the list. I exist, you exist, birds exist, or do they? Thoughts exist, and this sentence exists. And I say, well, maybe not, but we're not going to get into the debates here about the existence of composite objects. Okay. What about begins to exist? Well, here is a loose, imprecise, untechnical way to understand the term. This isn't exactly the sense at issue in the Kalam, but it's close enough for pedagogical purposes. I'll get to that exact sense in a bit. So just hold your horses. So, something begins to exist when it exists at some time, and it didn't exist, that is to say, it did not instantiate. Okay, I need to stop, I need to be serious. Okay, <clears throat> something begins to exist when it exists at some time and didn't exist temporally or explanatorily prior to that time. So, something begins to exist at its earliest temporal boundary, provided it didn't exist explanatorily prior to that boundary. Right, because if it did exist explanatorily prior to that boundary, say, in a kind of timeless existence, as an example, well, then the thing didn't really begin to exist at its first moment. Rather, it really just began to be temporal. It didn't really come into being in the first place. It didn't arrive onto the scene of reality, as it were. Instead, it just began to be temporal. But anyway, here are some illustrations. The Earth began to exist around 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, I began to exist almost 23 years ago. The Kalam cosmological argument began to exist around the 6th century, and so on. Now, here's a more precise technical way to understand the term. At least on Craig's and many others' version of the Kalam, this is the sense of begins to exist at play in the causal principle. So where x ranges over any entity, 
and t ranges over times, whether instants of time or moments of non-zero finite duration. x begins to exist at t if and only if x comes into being at t. Now, of course, by itself, that's not very helpful because, well, we're left wondering what it is for something to come into being at a given time. And that's where we get this. x comes into being at time t if and only if 1, x exists at t, and the actual world includes no state of affairs in which x exists timelessly. 2, t is either the first time at which x exists or is separated from any earlier time at which x existed by an interval during which x does not exist. And 3, x is existing at t is a tensed fact. At least as Craig is using begins to exist then, only under a tensed view of time do things genuinely begin to exist, because then and only then do you have genuine tensed facts. You can think of a tensed fact as a fact about what was the case in the past, or what is the case in the present, or what will be the case in the future, which is not reducible to tenseless facts about things as positions along a timeline. So then there really is a kind of genuine temporal dynamism in reality, and x is really arriving onto the scene anew, as it were. x isn't just at some kind of location in a tenseless four-dimensional space-time block. Anyway, if that's all a little bit complicated, that's not going to matter too much for this video. I just wanted to cross all the t's and dot all the i's. At any rate, that is how Craig and Sinclair articulate it, and that is the sense that we're going to be using going forward, although the tensed and tenseless theories of time aren't going to be playing too much of a role in the discussion going forward. So again, you don't have to worry about that too much. Now, there's one pitfall of this definition, which is even a pitfall by Craig's lights. Namely, the definition would entail that something which pre-exists metric time in a beginningless, non-metric, or amorphous time begins to exist. But that's the wrong result. Just as a being that enters into metric time from a state of timelessness doesn't begin to exist, but rather only begins to be temporal, essentially the same is true of a being that enters into metric time from a state of beginningless non-metric time. Such a being doesn't begin to exist, but only begins to be metrically temporal. And note that because non-metric time is non-metric, there's no fact of the matter about how long it is. Right? It's not metricated, so there's no fact of the matter about how metrically long it is. And so this view doesn't entail that the time extends infinitely into the past. It also doesn't entail that the non-metric time extends finitely far into the past with a beginning point, since that would again introduce metrication. By the way, for more on this non-metric time prior to the beginning of metric time, as a proposal about the temporal structure of reality, you can see Richard Swinburne's article God in Time, Alan Paget's 1992 book God, Eternity, and the Nature of Time, and Ryan Mullins' forthcoming book From Divine Time Maker to Divine Watchmaker. And I say that this is a pitfall by Craig's own lights, because Craig has said that he regards this Oxford school as theologically respectable. The Oxford school is a school that views God's relation to time as God being the creator of metric time, but God a pre-existing metric time in this kind of non-metric or metrically amorphous time. Craig has said that he regards this Oxford school as a theologically respectable, viable option for theists. It's not Craig's preferred view, of course, but Craig still thinks it's theologically legitimate. You can see, for instance, his discussion with Ryan Mullins on my channel, wherein he said precisely this sort of thing. But he wouldn't think this if he thought that the Oxford school's view implied that God began to exist. So then, another way for something to fail to begin to exist is if it pre-exists the beginning of metric time in a non-metric or metrically amorphous time. So then the proper technical understanding of begins to exist at play in the Kalam cosmological argument is the following. x begins to exist at t if and only if x comes into being at t, which is the case if and only if 1. x exists at t and the actual world includes neither a state of affairs in which x exists timelessly, nor a state of affairs in which x exists in a non-metric time prior to metric time. 2. t is either the first time at which x exists or is separated from any earlier time at which x existed by an interval during which x does not exist, and 3. x is existing at t is a tensed fact. Alright, so I apologize because that was all a little bit technical, a little bit complicated, but I hope you're still with me. I tried to explain it. And having covered the term begins to exist and what that means for purposes of the argument, we can now move on to cause and what that means for the purposes of this argument. So x causes y just in case x produces or brings about y. In this case, x is the cause and y is the effect. And the notion of causation at play here is, by the way, efficient causation. Now, there's lots of controversy over what causation is. I mean, we can ask, is it a relation only between events? Does it also relate objects or substances? Does it only relate objects or substances? Is it reducible to other features of reality? We don't need to worry about these questions here. We just need to note some key distinctions between different kinds of causation. 
So first, there's a distinction, at least in principle, between deterministic and indeterministic causes, which I think will be important to have on our radars before getting into the assessment of the causal principle. So a deterministic cause necessitates its effect. In any possible world in which the cause exists, the effect also exists. To put it a bit informally, given that the cause occurs, the effect must then occur. For example, provided that the environmental conditions are right, if a domino hits another domino, the other domino must fall. By contrast, an indeterministic cause does not necessitate its effect. Given the exact same initial causal conditions, a different effect, or perhaps no effect at all, could have occurred. In other words, given that the cause occurs, the effect may or may not occur. Both options are genuinely possible. All right, so we know what causes are, we've distinguished between deterministic and indeterministic causes, we know what it means for something to begin to exist, and we know what existence is. Now let's get on to the arguments in favor of the causal principle. I'll be covering the following arguments for the causal principle. The argument from intuition, from induction, from abduction, from chaos, and the modus tollens argument. I can't hope to cover every possible argument for or against the causal principle, mind you, but these are some of the most prominent ones, and they certainly cover exhaustively Craig's case for the causal principle. So first up is the argument from intuition, and here we're going to be watching a video that I produced with Stephen Woodford. So let's get into that. Oh, and by the way, because patrons have access to this document, they also have access to this script. You can click on that and read the script for that video. Same with all these other videos that I'm going to be mentioning. We're going to be going through three different videos. So as you can see, I'm trying to entice you. But anyway, let's get on to the argument from intuition. I think it is an obvious first principle of metaphysics. Being does not come from non-being. Something does not come from nothing. Atheists themselves recognize this truth. For example, David Hume wrote to John Stuart, I never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. I only maintained that our certainty of the falsehood of that proposition proceeded neither from intuition nor demonstration, but from another source. Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well and that your intuitive spidey senses are tingling. For today we're going to deep dive into stage one of the old Kalam. Oh boy! More specifically, myself and the infinitely talented Joe Schmid from the Majesty of Reason are going to be focusing on the intuitive argument in favour of the causal principle, which constitutes the first premise. That whatever begins to exist has a cause. But first, let's get this train back on the rails. It's been eight months since we published our first video in this series, but we assure you that the delay between this episode and the next won't be nearly as long. We are pulling no punches and doing everything within our finite ability to create the best online Kalam resource to date. And for this episode, there's a lot of stations, a lot of literature. Also, until recently, Joe's been busy studying with the Avengers, and without him in the driving seat, this series wouldn't be a quarter of what it's going to be. Honestly, this dude lives and breathes metaphysics, and so please, 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 if you get something out of this, be sure to subscribe to the Majesty of Reason. Joe is going places, and if you subscribe, he'll take you along for the ride. Lastly, in our first episode, we said that our second episode, this episode, will focus on stage one of what we'll call the Old Kalam. In particular, we'll focus on the causal principle, as well as the purported scientific support for the universe's beginning from Big Bang cosmology. However, we've since decided to dedicate independent episodes to each argument. Because, and to be transparent, let's say that you're interested in the argument from chaos. You don't think, do you, that things can just pop into existence uncaused? Well, first and foremost, you might not ever find an episode in which we tackle it since our video won't have the relevant SEO. That is, it won't sufficiently target the keywords that you're searching. And secondly, if you did find it, you'd bounce after digesting the segment. And of course, why wouldn't you? Your interest was with the argument from chaos, not, for instance, Andrew Loke's modus tollens argument. The modus tollens argument. But your bounce would, unfortunately, negatively impact the video's retention, which is a big no-no in YouTube land. So yeah, great news. You're going to get more videos, more memes, and more bea beautiful thumbnails. Hey peeps, yes, I know, I know, I'm now twice the age I was in the first video, but we're just going to ignore that. So, as Steven said, our focus in this video is going to be premise one of stage one of the old Kalam. Recall from our first video that the Kalam has two stages. 
Stage 1 aims to infer at least one first cause of the universe, whereas Stage 2 aims to infer important divine attributes of the entity arrived at in Stage 1. Also recall that the Kalam comes in different forms, most notably the Old Kalam and New Kalam. The New Kalam relies on causal finitism, whereas the Old Kalam doesn't. The Old Kalam's causal principle, moreover, relies on a variety of arguments, including the argument from intuition, which is what we're going to focus on here. Finally, recall the Old Kalam itself. Whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. But before delving into the argument from intuition, let's get really clear on what precisely the Kalam's first premise is saying. We need to understand three basic concepts before assessing premise one. Existence, begins to exist, and cause. So how exactly is existence defined? Well, it's widely recognized that existence is notoriously difficult to define. Roughly, however, a given thing X exists so long as that thing is in reality. That is, there is such a thing as X. By the way, I put on this shirt just to explain existence. Uh, that means there exists an X, and that little backwards E, that's called the existential quantifier. But, of course, when I wear the shirt, it's more appropriately called the sexistential quantifier. <laughs> that was more like the look. Okay, moving on. What about begins to exist? Here's an easy way to understand it. Something begins to exist when it exists at some time and didn't exist prior to that time. Or in other words, something's life, so to speak, has an earliest temporal boundary. For instance, the Earth began to exist around 4.54 billion years ago. Joe began to exist around 21 years ago. And an event like a football match begins to exist when the whistle blows. To the Arsenal 1 nil. To the Arsenal. <laughs> This is so cringe. So, so... So, if it's not clear by now, Joe has somewhat of an affiliation with Arsenal. Another beautifully worked goal! Anyhow, there are more precise and philosophically respectful ways of cashing out what it means to say that something begins to exist, and we should have these on our radar. William Lane Craig offers the following analysis specific to the tense theory of time. By the way, tense theories of time say that there are objective, mind-independent, non-relative facts about what is past, present, and future, and these facts are called tensed facts. Here, then, is Craig's analysis of begins to exist. Where x ranges over any entity, and t ranges over times, whether instants or moments of non-zero finite duration, a x begins to exist at t if and only if x comes into being at t, and b x comes into being at t if and only if 1 x exists at t and the actual world includes no state of affairs in which x exists timelessly, 2 t is either the first time at which x exists or is separated from any t prime which is earlier than t at which x existed by an interval during which x does not exist, and 3 x is existing at t is a tensed fact. Or as Craig expresses in simpler terms, the key criterion for determining if something has a beginning is its past metrical finitude. Something has a beginning just in case the time during which it existed is finite. Now let's define cause. So the notion of cause at play here is what philosophers call an efficient cause. And for simplicity, we'll just use the term cause. So something causes something else just in case the former produces or brings about the latter. Or, put more succinctly, x causes y just in case x produces or brings about y. In this case, x is the cause and y is the effect. For example, my kicking the soccer ball causes the ball to fly off. Other examples include smoking causes lung cancer, watching this epic Kalam series causes you to experience profound happiness and delight, and so on. The final thing needing clarification is the characterization of premise 1, that is, the Kalam's causal principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause. For starters, we should avoid characterizing the denial or negation of premise 1 in a misleading way. Someone who denies premise 1 but accepts premise 2 might hold that the universe began to exist without a cause. But sometimes defenders of the Kalam equate the denial of premise 1 with the suggestion that once upon a time, prior to the existence of the universe, there was a situation or state in which nothing at all, not even time, existed. And then out of that black hole of nothingness, the universe popped into existence. To be sure, this is nonsense. There is no time at which there is no time, and if there were nothing at all, there would of course be nothing at all, not even a popping into existence. Nor is there a state of nothingness from which the universe could arise. But such absurdities are not entailed by the simple denial of the proposition that the beginning of the universe has a cause. To deny premise one is not to say that something can come from a prior state of non-being or nothingness. 
Instead, to deny premise one is simply to say that something can begin to exist without being caused to do so. Well, I, I just realized that I didn't change my shirt back, so on to that. <laughs> What we learn from this clarification is that advocates of the Klom would do well to avoid talking about the impossibility of something coming into existence out of sheer nothingness. It's a source of potential confusion, and it adds nothing to the case for premise one. Note, though, that we will occasionally use the locutions pop or spring into existence within our series simply because, first, we'll occasionally follow the way that advocates of the Klom themselves speak. That things can just pop into existence uncaused. And, second, because it's sometimes linguistically simpler and less chunky. Chunky. <laughs> less chunky. <laughs> And second, because it's sometimes linguistically simpler and less clunky than more accurate and precise alternatives. Just keep this note in mind whenever you hear it throughout our series. Our second clarification is that not every version of the Kalam contains the unrestricted causal principle that absolutely everything that begins to exist has a cause. Some versions say instead simply that if our universe began to exist, then our universe has a cause. Craig, for instance, tends to favour this restricted principle when debating physicists, such as Sean Carroll. Other versions are restricted in other ways. However, we will focus on the unrestricted causal principle for two reasons. First, it's by far the most commonly used causal principle in Kalam discussions. And secondly, if the unrestricted causal principle is false, that is, if at least one thing can come into existence uncaused, then it becomes unclear why we should believe the more restricted versions of the principle. So, with the background concepts defined and the characterization of premise one clarified, it's time to lean on our chunky intuition. It is argued by many proponents of the Kalam that the causal principle, that is premise one, just seems intuitively obvious. William Lane Craig writes, First and foremost, the principle is rooted in the metaphysical intuition that something cannot come into being from nothing, for to come into existence without a cause of any sort is to come into being from nothing. To suggest that things can just pop into being uncaused out of nothing is to quit doing serious metaphysics and to resort to magic. Nobody sincerely believes that things, say a horse or an Eskimo village, can just pop into being without a cause. Now we've already seen why the language of coming from nothing and popping into existence out of nothing is misleading. But set this aside, Craig's contention here is that premise one is supported by its intuitive obviousness. Before evaluating this, we need to understand how philosophers use the term intuition. As philosophers John Bankson, Terence Cuneo, and Russ Schaefer-Lando point out, an intuition is a conscious, non-sensory mental state or event in which it strikes one that things are a certain way when one reflects on the matter. So, intuitions aren't gut feelings or suspicions or instincts or anything like that. Instead, they are intellectual seemings. That is, ways things seem to you upon reflection. For example, when considering whether the fact that X is identical to Y and Y is identical to Z implies the fact that X is identical to Z, it might strike you that the answer is clearly and obviously yes. The same holds for the intuition that nothing could be colored without being a particular shade of color, that contradictions are impossible, and that believing against all evidence is irrational. To be sure, one or more of these claims may turn out to be false, and we may fail to believe or judge that one or more of them are true. But that's compatible with each of them being intuited, that is, with each of them striking us as if their truth is manifest or clear. Now, intuitions aren't infallible, but it's plausible that they provide at least some support for the intuitive claims. This support is defeasible. That is, it can, in principle, be overturned or overridden by countervailing considerations or reasons. But it's still support nonetheless. To see this, consider that scientific knowledge rests on intuitions. Scientists use tons of logic and mathematics in their experimentation and theorizing, and our logical and mathematical knowledge is based on the intuitive obviousness of certain logical and mathematical truths. For instance, it seems obvious that if P is true and P implies Q, then Q is true. We don't need to know this by sophisticated chains of reasoning or sophisticated experimental techniques. Instead, we can intuitively see that it must be true. Similarly, scientists rely on seemings in making measurements and observations. The scientist concludes that the pressure in their experimental system is 14 atmospheres because it seems that there's a pressure gauge in front of them that reads 14 atmospheres. Other scientists can repeat this measurement, of course, but they too will be relying on its seeming to be the case that there is a pressure gauge in front of them that reads 14 atmospheres. In short, if we couldn't trust seemings, science would be impossible. But back to the causal principle. 
Remember, according to Craig, it's intuitively obvious that nothing can spring into existence without some cause. Given that intuitions provide some support for the intuited claims, it follows that premise one is justified, at least in the absence of good reasons for thinking it's false, or for thinking that the intuition is misguided. And at least for those who share Craig's intuition here. So, with this on the table, let's now consider five responses to the argument from intuition. One response to the argument from intuition is to point out that intuitions are unreliable, that is, they don't tend to produce true beliefs. After all, lots of things that people have found intuitive, such as the Earth's flatness, have turned out to be dead wrong, and if intuition is unreliable, then intuition doesn't support premise one. In response, recall again that intuitions aren't infallible. Yes, sometimes claims that strike us as clearly true end up being false, but this just means that intuitions don't decisively prove anything. Yet it would be a far too hasty generalisation to say that all intuition is unreliable from the fact that some or even many intuitions have turned out to be false. After all, many beliefs based on perceptual experience, ranging from illusions, hallucinations and so on, have turned out to be false, but clearly we shouldn't conclude from this that all perception is unreliable. To further flesh out this response, consider again the case of the Earth's flatness. We can grant that lots of people found this intuitively obvious, and perhaps still find it intuitively obvious. But it's crucial to see that the reasons for thinking it's false themselves rely on intuitions. We've performed experiments and made observations that show that the Earth is round, and those experiments and observations rest on a basic trust of our intuitions. Without trusting our logical and mathematical intuitions, such as the intuition that the Earth can't be both flat and round at the same time and in the same respect, or indeed that there is an external world at all, we wouldn't be able to justify drawing inferences about the Earth's shape from our observations. What's more, this very response to Craig's appeal to intuition rests on intuitions. The idea behind the response is something like, one, we know from experience that lots of our past beliefs based on intuitive obviousness are entirely mistaken. Two, if premise one is true, then intuition isn't reliable. So conclusion three, intuition isn't reliable. But why should we conclude that three follows from one and two? Even if we grant that one and two are true, why should we conclude three? Ultimately, at Bedrock, the reason we think that 3 follows from 1 and 2 is that this is simply obvious or self-evident. Note that it won't help to offer another argument for why 1 and 2 allows us to conclude 3, since that very argument will simply raise the exact same question. Why think the conclusion follows from the premises? In the end, we have to appeal to the obviousness of the inference rule to allow us to infer the conclusion from the premises. It should be noted though that while there probably won't be a good argument that intuition is unreliable full stop, there could in principle be a good argument that intuition is unreliable in certain specific domains or conditions. We know, for instance, that while perception in general is reliable, there are certain domains, like in the dark, and conditions, like being drunk, in which perception isn't reliable. Two shots of vodka. Thus, another path one could take in responding to Craig's appeal to intuition is that, while intuition is generally reliable, Craig is applying them in a certain domain or in certain conditions for which we have good reason to think intuition isn't reliable. For instance, courtesy of general relativity, we have good reason to doubt lots of our temporal intuitions, and courtesy of quantum mechanics, we have good reason to doubt lots of our causal intuitions. We won't explore these issues further for purposes of space, but suffice it to note for now that if the detractor can justify why intuition is unreliable in certain domains or conditions, and why the intuition in question is in one such domain or condition, then they'll have defeated Craig's appeal to intuition. A second response to Craig's appeal to intuition is to argue that intuition doesn't, after all, support the causal principle. Philosopher Wes Morriston argues this precisely in his article, Must the Beginning of the Universe Have a Personal Cause? To show that a priori intuition doesn't support the causal principle, he examines two marks or signs of proposition supported by a priori intuition, and argues that it's not at all clear that the causal principle satisfies them. One mark or sign of a proposition supported by a priori intuition is that once someone grasps it, they see that it must be true. The proposition has a type of luminosity or clarity that makes it impossible, or at the very least, very difficult for them not to believe it. A standard example of a proposition knowable this way is that the surface of an object cannot be both red all over and partly green at one and the same time. 
If somebody doesn't see that this proposition is true, we'll probably suspect that they haven't paid proper attention or that they simply don't understand it yet. Once they come to grasp it, though, we expect them to see its truth. A second marker sign of a proposition supported by a priori intuition is that the better acquainted we are with the intuited proposition, that is, the more fully we see what it says and just what is involved in asserting it, the clearer it will be to us that the proposition must be true. It shouldn't be the case that making distinctions necessary to understand the proposition simply makes it more obscure and less certain. Importantly, contends Morriston, the causal principle doesn't satisfy these two conditions, or at least it's not clear whether it does. And in that case, it's unclear whether it's supported by a priori intuition. And if that's true, the appeal to intuition in favor of the causal principle fails. So let's examine Morriston's claim that the causal principle doesn't satisfy the first condition. Is it the case that when we grasp the causal principle, we see that it must be true? For Morriston, it's not at all clear that this is the case. Almost everyone who considers the proposition that the surface of an object cannot be both red all over and partly green at one and the same time sees that this has to be true, whereas lots of people, many of them philosophers, report no such intuition of the causal principle's claim. Indeed, many have the intuition that the causal principle is not necessarily true. For instance, many philosophers think they can perfectly well conceive of a world in which things come into existence without causes. In fact, as long as it doesn't happen too often, it could be a world much like the one that actually exists. And while conceivability doesn't strictly imply possibility, many philosophers think that, Intuitively, the ability to conceive something without apparent contradiction is evidence, albeit defeasible evidence, for its possibility. What this tells us is that many philosophers not only don't share the intuition behind the causal principle, but also positively possess intuitions conflicting with it. Now let's examine Morrison's case that the causal principle doesn't satisfy the second condition. Is it the case that the better we understand the causal principle, the clearer it is that it cannot be false? Again, for Morriston, it's not at all clear that this is the case. For starters, deeper reflection on, and better understanding of, causation arguably leaves the causal principle less clearly true. Must causes precede their effects in time? Must causes bear some temporal relation to their effects? Must causal events be governed by laws? How we answer these questions will influence how plausible we think the causal principle is. And these questions don't have easy, obvious answers. Moreover, if we consider origins of universes, or of times prior to which there are no times, Morriston writes that I have no intuition about what causal principles would have to hold in a situation so remote from ordinary life. When I compare the beginning of time itself to the particular beginnings within time of which I have experience, I can only say, God knows, I don't. Thus, for Morriston, the more fully we understand and appreciate what is involved in the causal principle, the less obvious it is that it's a necessary truth. By contrast, nothing like this happens when we examine the claim that something can't be both red all over and somewhat green. The more carefully we consider that proposition, the clearer it is that it must be true. So it's not at all clear that the causal principle satisfies two important criteria for determining whether a proposition is supported by a priori intuition. If Morriston is right about this, then Craig's argument from intuition fails. As icing on top of the cake, Morriston concludes that anyone who claims to have an a priori intuition of premise 1 must be prepared to explain why other equally well-informed and intelligent persons who have attended closely to one made all the relevant distinctions and clearly understood what it says, nevertheless fail to see that it is true. If it is so obvious, how can they fail to see it? How might the proponent of the argument from intuition respond to Morriston? Well, they might argue that his methodology here is simply flawed. He compares the causal principle to a truth like the surface of an object cannot be both red all over and partly green at one and the same time. And he finds that the causal principle lacks the self-evidence and perspicuity of this truth. But this seems to assume that all intuitively grasped, metaphysically necessary truths are alike in their self-evidence and perspicuity. But that just isn't true. Such propositions have varying degrees of self-evidence and perspicuity. For example, the claim that if change exists, then time exists, is an intuitively obvious necessary truth, but it arguably doesn't enjoy the self-evidence or perspicuity of Morriston's red and green example. And like the notion of cause, the notions of change and time are fraught with interesting philosophical puzzles with non-obvious answers. Thus, the further we reflect on and understand this proposition, the less clearly true it may become. But that doesn't mean we aren't justified in accepting it by dint of its intuitive obviousness.
Moreover, most people grant that the claim, torturing a child just for fun is wrong, must be true on the basis of its intuitive obviousness. But it's at least conceivable that there's a world in which actions like torture lack the property of wrongness. And even if we grant that conceivability provides defeasible evidence for possibility, what we need to do here is compare the plausibility of the respective claims, and, all else being equal, side with the one that strikes us as more plausible. And, at least according to defenders of the argument from intuition, the claim that whatever begins to exist has a cause enjoys greater plausibility than that lent to the claim that some things can begin to exist uncaused by the defeasible evidence of its conceivability. Finally, recall Morriston's question that iced the top of the cake. If the causal principle is so obvious, how can lots of honest, intelligent, and well-informed people fail to see its truth upon reflection? But perhaps Morriston is afflicted with an equally pressing question. If the causal principle isn't intuitively obvious, how can lots, indeed arguably the majority of honest, intelligent, and well-informed people seem to see its truth upon reflection? We aren't able to settle this particular dispute here. We want to give you guys the tools to think critically about the causal principle so that you can make up your own mind on the matter. Don't just take our word. Use the lights of reason and experience to test out premise one for yourself. That's how we become responsible, independent, critical thinkers. A third response to the argument from intuition is that lots of principles that contradict the Kalam are equally supported by intuition. As Wes Morriston writes, different intuitions pull us in different directions. Some may support the traditional theistic picture of creation, but others don't. In particular, I think that creation out of nothing is at least as counterintuitive as beginning to exist without a cause. When I try to conjure up a picture of something, a house, say, popping into existence without a cause, it does seem absurd. Houses don't just materialise out of nothing, they have to be built. But I don't see how considerations of this sort can be appealed to by someone who believes in creatio ex nihilo. After all, a house popping into existence out of nowhere doesn't seem any less absurd just because someone says, or thinks, let there be a house where there was no house. Now, in response to Morriston's principle denying creation ex nihilo, one might say that God is omnipotent, and so of course he could do such a thing. But this response is entirely unsatisfactory, since omnipotence is restricted to the ability only to do what's possible. And yet, whether creation ex nihilo is possible is the very question at issue here. And indeed, intuition seems to strongly tell against its possibility. In short, the absence of a material cause seems at least as troubling as the absence of an efficient cause. At the level of raw intuition, the idea of something beginning without an efficient cause doesn't seem more absurd than that of somebody making a universe out of absolutely nothing. What we learn from this is that if we assume that the Kalam, if successful, shows that all of material reality had a beginning and that such a beginning must have been caused ex nihilo, then accepting the Kalam would entail denying an intuitively obvious principle. In turn, accepting the principle entails rejecting the Kalam. But, crucially, there doesn't seem to be any reason for preferring the intuition that whatever begins to exist has a cause over the intuition that whatever begins to exist is made out of pre-existent stuff. If we accept the former, then it seems we should accept the latter. But, as we've seen, accepting the latter entails rejecting the Kalam. Hence, if we should accept the intuition allegedly supporting the Kalam's first premise, then we should reject the Kalam. It seems, then, that defenders of the Kalam must either reject the intuition that supports the first premise, or else reject the Kalam itself. There is, though, a third option for defenders of the Kalam. In particular, they could try to show why we should prefer the intuition that everything that begins to exist has a cause over the intuition that everything that begins to exist is made of pre-existing stuff. But firstly, this won't be an easy task, and secondly, there are lots of other principles that are both deeply intuitive and incompatible with the Kalam. It's going to be exceedingly difficult to show, for each such principle, that we should prefer the Kalam principle over it. And it's going to be even harder to show that we should prefer the Kalam principle over the destruction of all these other Kalam incompatible principles. Here are just a few other principles that seem intuitively plausible, but that are either incompatible with the Kalam or with traditional theism. 2. Every material object that begins to exist has a material cause, i.e. some things or stuff from which it is made. Now, note that this is distinct from Morriston's principle, since principle 2 is restricted to material objects. Morriston's principle, by contrast, applies to the creation of anything material, 
Also note that there are similar principles in the vicinity. Philosopher Felipe Leon defends the principle of material causality, which states that every concrete object with an originating or sustaining cause has a material cause, in the sense of some things or stuff from which it is made. For us, though, we're focused on Principle 2, as stated. Now, Principle 2 seems deeply plausible. If you discovered a log cabin in the woods, and its owner told you that they made the log cabin without any material whatsoever, no wood, no logs, no nails, no plaster, no mortar, no mud, you would think they've gone insane. And if we assume that the Kalam, if successful, shows that all of material reality had a beginning, and that such a beginning must have been caused ex nihilo, then the Kalam would imply that the universe is a material object that begins to exist without a material cause. Hence, this intuitive principle is incompatible with the Kalam. To be sure, Craig considers something analogous to this principle in his work. One thing he says in response is that the principle may simply be overridden by the arguments for the finitude of the past. For if it is impossible that there be an infinite regress of past events, it is impossible for the first cause to be a material object, since matter slash energy is never quiescent. He continues that we shouldn't then reject the causal principle in addition, for if coming into being without a material cause seems impossible, coming into being with neither a material nor an efficient cause is doubly absurd. But there are at least four problems with Craig's response here. First, we could equally say that the arguments for the finitude of the past may simply be overridden by the intuitive obviousness of principle two. Second, it's not at all clear that matter slash energy is never quiescent. While the matter slash energy in our experience is never quiescent, there isn't any clear reason why this must apply categorically to all kinds of matter and energy that there could be, including kinds we've never experienced, such as that which may have existed at or before the beginning of the universe. It's also not clear why this must apply to the kinds of matter we've experienced in all conditions it could find itself in, including conditions far removed from our ordinary experience. In fact, accepting this intuitively obvious principle, along with accepting the arguments for the finitude of the past, may together give one very strong reason to think that some matter can, after all, be quiescent under some conditions. Third, while material cause might suggest matter or energy, notice how we actually defined it. The things or stuff from which something is made. This need not be matter or energy. It might be the case, for instance, that there is some non-material entity that causes the universe to begin to exist by transforming itself in some way, or partitioning itself off in some manner. Alternatively, something else might have transformed it in some manner. This is precisely what, for instance, many panentheists who deny creation ex nihilo think is true. God creates ex deus, or out of the resources of his own being, as it were. This is incompatible with traditional theism, of course, but our point is that Craig is wrong to insist that the principle requires that the material cause has to be matter or energy. Fourth, as Wes Morriston argues, Craig's claim about double absurdity just misses the point. I brought up the intuitive absurdity of creatio ex nihilo only in order to suggest that our intuitions about such matters, that is, our intuitions about the conditions required for there to be an absolute beginning of time and matter itself, may not be especially reliable. The fact that Craig himself is forced to take a position that runs counter to one of his own strong intuitions merely reinforces this point. Here's a third principle that's both deeply intuitive and yet conflicts with the Kalam. 3. Causes must be either before or simultaneous with their effects. Again, this principle seems really plausible. Causation intuitively seems intimately bound up with time. And if we assume that the Kalam, if successful, shows that all of temporal reality had a beginning, and that such a beginning must have been caused by something non-temporal, then the Kalam implies that not all causes are before or simultaneous with their effects. Hence, principle 3 is incompatible with the Kalam. At this point, it's interesting to observe that some of the very philosophers that Craig cites as favouring his own causal principle also hold that causes must precede their effects in time. Take, for instance, David Hume. In other words, what Hume was saying was that he couldn't prove the causal principle that anything that begins to exist has a cause, but he regarded its denial as metaphysically absurd, and so he believed the, the principle. But, of course, David Hume's famous analysis of the causal relation in A Treatise of Human Nature explicitly includes the principle that causes must precede their effects in time. And in another passage quoted by Craig, C.D. Broad says that he cannot believe that anything could begin to exist without being caused by something else which existed before and up to the moment when the existing thing in question began to exist. 
As Wes Morrison notes in this regard, it is important to see that in order to get the Kalam argument off the ground, Craig must take controversial positions on a number of highly debatable issues having to do with the nature of time and of causation. Contrary to what Craig supposes, therefore, a sane adult may have sincere and quite reasonable doubts about the scope of premise one of the Kalam argument. Now, it should be noted that, according to Craig, this principle is, quote, not at all incompatible with the Kalam argument's conclusion, since its defender may hold that God's act of causing the beginning of the universe is simultaneous with the universe's beginning to exist, end quote. But this is mistaken. For if God's act of causing the beginning of the universe is simultaneous with the universe's beginning to exist, then God's act of causing the beginning of the universe itself began to exist at the first moment of time, and hence, per the Kalam's causal principle, would require a cause. Now, that cause is either timeless or temporal. If it's timeless, then we get the unintuitive result that not all causes are temporally related to their effects. If it's temporal, then it too began to exist, and so requires a cause, per the Kalam's causal principle. We cannot proceed to infinity among such causes, lest Craig admit actual infinites, and hence a cause that isn't temporally related to its effect is unavoidable for the Kalam proponent. Finally, Craig might once again say that the strong intuitive case for Principle 2 is simply overridden by his a priori arguments against the infinite past when they are taken together with the Kalam's causal principle. If every beginning has a cause, and there can be no temporal cause at the beginning of time, then Principle 3 is false. But as Wes Morrison notes, quote, even if Craig's arguments against the infinite past are better than I think they are, this is quite a dangerous line for him to take. For the critic can make precisely the same move, arguing the Kalam's causal principle is quote-unquote simply overridden by the same arguments when they are taken together with principle 3. A third and final principle we consider is, for every case of mental causation is durational i.e., whenever a mind produces an effect, the mind undergoes some temporal process in doing so. This, too, seems quite intuitive, and yet it's incompatible with the Kalam, since God's mentally causing the beginning of the time couldn't itself presuppose God undergoing some temporal process. Overall, then, the argument from intuition might actually do more harm than good to the Kalam. The fourth response to the argument from intuition is that the intuition is considerably weakened, if not entirely removed, under the B-theory of time. According to the B-theory of time, there is no mind-independent, objective, temporal becoming or dynamism. Time is in some sense static. There is no progression of things from the past, through the present, and into the future. The B-theory of time is often conjoined with a view called four-dimensionalist eternalism, which says that all times and contents of times exist. No time is objectively privileged as present or existent. Rather, all times enjoy an equal ontological status. Things are just extended or spread out not only in three spatial dimensions, but also across the temporal dimension. Here's how Craig puts the objection from the B-theory of time. B-theorists deny that in beginning to exist, the universe came into being or became actual. They thereby focus attention on the theory of time underlying the Kalam cosmological argument. From start to finish, the Kalam cosmological argument is predicated upon the A theory of time. On a B theory of time, the universe does not in fact come into being or become actual at the Big Bang. It just exists tenselessly as a four-dimensional space-time block that is finitely extended in the earlier-than direction. If time is tenseless, then the universe never really comes into being, and therefore the quest for a cause of its coming into being is misconceived. There would be no reason to look for a cause of the universe's beginning to exist, since on tenseless theories of time, the universe did not begin to exist in virtue of its having a first event, any more than a meter stick begins to exist in virtue of having a first centimeter. The key thing to notice is that under the B theory of time, even if the past is finite, the universe doesn't really come into being. It doesn't pop into existence or spring into reality. Instead, the earliest edge of the universe is just statically, unchangingly, and eternally there. To use Craig's analogy, the earliest edge of the universe is analogous to the front end of a ruler. And, crucially, the claim that every static, unchanging, earliest temporal boundary has a cause is either not intuitive at all, or, at the very least, its intuitive force is relatively weak. Now, going into a debate between A and B theorists would take us too far afield, 
Suffice it to note for present purposes that the argument from intuition for the Kalam's first premise needs significant reinforcement, since its intuitive force relies quite heavily on the falsity of the B-theory. And yet the B-theory is a perfectly respectful position both on philosophical and scientific grounds. Proving it false will be difficult, and hence it will be difficult to mount a successful argument from intuition that relies on its falsity. Kalam proponents will probably respond that while the B-theory friendly causal principle that everything with an earliest temporal boundary has a cause might be somewhat less intuitive than the original principle, it's still very intuitively plausible. They might argue that spatial boundaries seem to require causal explanations. It's not as though the boundaries of my laptop or the Eiffel Tower or a tree or a star could exist without any cause whatsoever. Instead, it seems plausible that there's some causal reason why they have the boundaries they do. And given that this is intuitive in the case of spatial boundaries, it likewise seems intuitive in the case of temporal boundaries under B-theoretic eternalism. Or so the Kalam proponent might argue. A fifth and final response to the argument from intuition depends on you. In particular, it depends on whether you share the relevant intuition. Clearly, appeals to a claim's intuitive obviousness won't convince you if you don't even find the claim intuitively obvious. This is one of the limitations of appeals to intuition. If you don't share the intuition, then they really don't do anything for you in terms of giving you a reason to accept the claim in question. So that's yet another way to respond. If you don't share the intuition, the argument from intuition for premise one is simply powerless for you. In the context of Abrahamic faith and in a throwback to Blaise Pascal, you might be just so made as not to believe. Well, you did it, my fellow ape. You made it through the episode. And for that, you are awesome. Let's wrap up. We began by clarifying the terms of the argument, namely existence, begins to exist, and cause. Then we emphasised that denying the causal premise does not mean endorsing creation from nothing, which is, unfortunately, a rather common accusation from Kalam proponents. We then presented the argument from intuition, the holy grail of this video, the intuition that something cannot come into being from nothing. And this is where the rubber met the road. We gave five responses, with our first being to point out that intuitions are unreliable. They don't tend to produce true beliefs, and especially when applied to areas far removed from our experience. Drawing from Wes Morriston, our second response was to argue that intuition doesn't, after all, support the causal principle, since it doesn't satisfy the two marks of proposition supported by a priori intuition. Sticking with our main man Morriston, for the third response we noted many other intuitive principles that contradict the Kalam and or theism, and noted the very difficult task issued on the Kalam proponent to explain why we should abandon the disjunction of all of these other Kalam incompatible principles. Our fourth response referred to the B-theory of time, and the fact that under the B-theory the causal principle is, at best, significantly weakened. Finally, for our fifth response, we acknowledged the fact that some people simply do not have the intuition that everything that begins to exist has a cause. And if you are such a person, then, trivially, for you, the argument from intuition is dead from the get-go. Alright, so that was the argument from intuition, now we're going on to the arguments from induction and abduction. And once more, it's video time. And once more, here's the script for patrons. Common experience and scientific evidence confirm the truth of premise one. Premise one is constantly verified and never falsified. It's hard to understand how any atheist committed to modern science could deny that premise one is more plausibly true than false in light of the evidence. Now know well that the third reason is an appeal to inductive reasoning, not reasoning by composition. It's drawing an inductive inference about all the members of a class of things based on a sample of the class. Inductive reasoning undergirds all of science and is not to be confused with reasoning by composition, which is a fallacy. Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well. 
Welcome to the third episode of this Kalam series. If you'd like to see the previous two chunky episodes, then you can find the playlist link below. And if you'd like to see a whole range of discussions on the Kalam between Joe Schmid and other various players in the literature, then likewise, you can find the playlist link below. And talking of Schmid, I'll yield the stage to him. As a reminder of where we are in the series, we're examining premise one of stage one of the old Kalam. Recall that stage one of the Kalam aims to infer at least one first cause of the universe, while stage two attempts to identify that cause with God. And as we all know by now, the old Kalam runs as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, so the universe has a cause. In our previous video, we unpacked the terms in premise one and clarified what exactly it's saying. With that foundation laid, we examined the argument from intuition in support of the causal principle expressed in that premise. Being does not come from non-being. Something does not come from nothing. Atheists themselves recognize this truth. In this video, we'll be examining a second reason in support of premise one. As we'll explain, the second reason is based on our universal experience of causal order. Anyway, with all that covered, let's get into the juicy stuff. Juicy. Yeah, Joe, you just said let's get to the juicy stuff, but this next section isn't the juicy stuff. It's it's literally us just clarifying the key concepts of our episode. Well, I don't know about you, but I find getting clear on key concepts incredibly juicy. In fact, I think it's titillating. What the hell was even that? Titillating. So let's let's agree never to use that adjective again, okay? Can we all just objectively agree that that's, that's not an adjective anymore? Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? All right, so we have two juicy concepts to cover, or maybe they're chunky. In any case, the concepts are induction and inference to the best explanation. Induction is just a fancy term for a form of reasoning in which the premises of an argument support a conclusion, but do not guarantee or ensure its truth. And its logical form is, all observed Fs have property P, so probably all Fs have property P. Here, F stands for some arbitrary kind of thing, while P stands for some arbitrary property. F, for instance, might be dogs, diamonds, swans, planets, or particles, and P might be having four legs, are clear, being white, being spherical, or having negative charge. The reasoning here is inductive rather than deductive because the truth of the premise does not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. In principle, it could be the case that the premise is true while the conclusion is false. Nevertheless, the premise is taken to render the conclusion probable. Thus, whenever all observed instances of a phenomena are accompanied by a certain property, we have good reason to infer that, probably, every instance of that phenomena is accompanied by the same property. So let's consider a few examples of inductive reasoning, beginning with the following. All observed physical things obey the law of gravity. So, probably, all physical things obey the law of gravity. Pretty straightforward. Now, it's important to see that inductive arguments are defeasible. That is, the support that their premises lend to their conclusions can, in principle, be overturned or overridden by countervailing considerations or reasons. Consider that prior to the 17th century, Europeans had observed millions of swans for centuries, and all of them were white without exception. Following inductive reasoning, many Europeans might have argued that, premise one, all observed swans are white, so, probably, conclusion, all swans are white. But, of course, their inference was defeated in January 1667, when the Dutch explorer Willem de Vlaming reported... <laughs> Why do I, do I have to be the one who says this? But, of course, their inference was defeated in January 1667, when the Dutch explorer Willem de Vlaming reported black swans in Australia. And, yeah, of course it was in Australia, the land in which the most overpowered expansion Pokemon reside. Bruce is estimated to be about 43 years old, and he came to us um, from Bristol Zoo in 1993. What the hell is even that?! The perceptual and testimonial evidence of visitors to Australia served as a defeater for the aforementioned inductive argument. The discovery of adorable black swans knocked all the wind out of the argument, and probably was the Queen's best day ever. All right, enough of swans and induction. All right, don't do that. Don't be silly. Stop it. Stop it. What about inference to the best explanation? Well, this one is kind of self-explanatory, if you'll pardon the pun. It's a form of reasoning wherein we conclude that the best explanation or account of some range of phenomena is probably true. More specifically, inference to the best explanation takes the following form. 
For some collection of evidence, a specific hypothesis provides a good explanation of that evidence and explains the evidence better than any available rival hypothesis. So, probably, the specified hypothesis is true. Again, this form of reasoning is non-deductive and defeasible. It's non-deductive in that the truth of its premise doesn't guarantee the truth of its conclusion, and it's defeasible in that the support the premise provides for the conclusion can, in principle, be overturned or undercut. Nevertheless, this form of reasoning is prevalent in daily life, scientific practice, philosophical inquiry, and beyond. If, for instance, I wake up at midnight to the pitter-patter of what seem to be small feet, and if there's a hole in the kitchen wall and some of my cheese has gone missing, I can conclude that, probably, there's a mouse in my house. I conclude this because such a hypothesis provides a good explanation of the data, firstly, and furthermore, an explanation that's better than all available rival hypotheses. Like, say, the hypothesis that there are ghosts in my house playing a trick on me. <laughs> With these two key concepts covered, let's now consider the centerpiece of our episode, the inductive and explanatory reasons purportedly favoring the causal principle. As we've said, our goal for this episode is to investigate the support for premise one deriving from inductive generalization and inference to the best explanation. The support begins by noting that the causal principle is constantly confirmed in our experience. According to William Lane Craig, this gives us strong inductive and experiential reason to think that the causal principle is true. Here's how Craig himself puts it. The principle is constantly confirmed in our experience. Scientific naturalists thus have the strongest of motivations to accept it. It is precisely on the strength of the role played by the causal principle in science that the natural philosopher of science Bernolf Kandersheiner warns if taken seriously, the initial singularity is in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment that was a guiding line of research since Epicurus and Lucretius. Namely, out of nothing, nothing comes, which Kandenscheiner calls a metaphysical hypothesis which has proved so fruitful in every corner of science that we are surely well advised to try as hard as we can to eschew processes of absolute origin. In short, the causal principle is unanimously supported by experience. In general, we do in fact find causes when we look for them, and when we don't find them, for example when investigating an unsolved crime, we have reason to think that they're nevertheless there and would be found if only we had all the relevant evidence and the time and resources for a more thorough investigation. Not only is this just what we would expect if the causal principle were true, but it's not at all what we should expect if it were false. Craig isn't alone in his appeal to experiential confirmation. Philosophers Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen, in their 2018 book Necessary Existence, consider principles quite similar to the Kalam's causal principle, and what they say on behalf of such principles can likewise be said on behalf of the Kalam's principle. The principle, they note, is a simple inductive generalization from widespread instances of causal explanation. Causal explanations, after all, are part and parcel of our experience. They write, Steve discovers a puddle of milk on the floor and he wonders where it came from. I, I swear that is milk. He assumes there is an answer. And he assumes the answer explains, to some extent, the presence of the puddle of milk. Maybe the milk is there because someone spilled milk on the floor. By contrast, Steve doesn't even entertain the idea that the milk may have popped into place without any causal explanation at all. What's true for the milk, or milk, would seem to be equally true for, say, a pile of pebbles that appears on one's doorstep. One expects that there's a cause of its existence, whether or not anyone knows what that cause is. The same holds for a grove of trees that begins to sprout, and for an arbitrary array of stars or particles that form. For big things and small things, heavy things and light things, visible things and invisible things that all come into being. For each such beginning, we expect there to be a cause that brought the thing or things into existence. In each such case, we either find a cause after looking for one, or we expect with a high degree of confidence that there is such a cause, even if currently unknown. Accordingly, argue Proust and Rasmussen, it's reasonable to generalize from the many and varied cases of beginnings to exist having causes, to the general principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Proust and Rasmussen also argue that the causal principle is a relatively simple hypothesis, and that there doesn't seem to be a simpler principle that can account for the wide range of apparent instances of causal explanation. What's more, the principle also successfully predicts our widespread experience of things beginning to exist having causes. So, in light of the simplicity, predictive power, and empirical adequacy of the causal principle, we have good reason to think that it's true. 
or so the argument goes. By contrast, if the causal principle were false, we wouldn't predict our widespread experience to make a concerted effort to act as if it's true. That is, we wouldn't expect the principle to be so exceptionally empirically confirmed if it were in fact false. Finally, scientists often reasonably assume that the best among a set of causal explanations is probably the right one. And in ordinary reasoning, when we've ruled out all causal explanations but one, we reasonably take the remaining one to be true, at least tentatively. In summary, then, the inductive case for the causal principle is based on the fact that all observed beginnings to exist are either known or reasonably expected to have causes, and it inductively generalizes to the conclusion that all beginnings to exist have causes. The inference to the best explanation, on the other hand, is based on the fact that the causal principle not only provides a good explanation of our experiential data concerning beginnings to exist, but also provides a better explanation than any rival hypothesis. Overall, then, we have good reason to think that the causal principle is true. For the remainder of the video, we'll consider four responses to the inductive and explanatory arguments for premise one. A first response involves limiting the scope of the causal principle and arguing that such a restricted principle is equally supported by empirical evidence. For instance, one might limit the scope of the causal principle to everything within the universe, adopting only the principle that everything within the universe that begins to exist has a cause. Alternatively, one might limit the scope to every rearrangement of pre-existing stuff, affirming only that every rearrangement of pre-existing stuff has a cause. If we're only willing to grant either of these limited principles, then we'll be unable to infer that the universe requires a cause, since the universe is not within the universe, and the universe is not, at least according to traditional theism, merely a rearrangement of pre-existing stuff. Proponents of the Kalam can make several replies at this juncture. First, they'll likely distinguish between alternative principles and competing principles. Notice that the limited principle that whatever begins to exist within the universe has a cause is actually perfectly compatible with the more general causal principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause. In fact, the principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause clearly entails that whatever begins to exist within the universe has a cause. Further still, it also entails the principle that every rearrangement of pre-existent stuff has a cause. Put simply, these limiting principles don't actually compete with the Kalam's causal principle. So, suppose you have no reason to think that a universe that begins to exist cannot have a cause. In that case, the truth of one or more of the restricted principles would actually be quite strong evidence in favor of the more general causal principle, since the general principle would successfully predict the truth of those restricted principles. Compare that evidence for the proposition that all naturally occurring diamonds, not including the ones in my hand, are clear, is also evidence that all naturally occurring diamonds, including the ones in my hand, are clear. When the principles don't compete, and when one lacks independent reason to discriminate between cases, evidence for the one is plausibly evidence for the other. I don't actually have naturally occurring diamonds in my hand. It's my AirPod. My, my right AirPod? Yeah, it's my right AirPod, so... <laughs> to avoid this, one might try to add to a restricted principle that nothing else requires a cause. But this move only increases the complexity of the principle and lowers its probability by creating tension between its components. This is because the application of a principle to everything apart from X gives us reason to expect, that is, raises the probability of, the principle's application to X itself. For instance, the fact that every fossil not including fossil X in a particular stratum is 65 million years old gives us good reason to expect that fossil X is likewise 65 million years old. The hypothesis that every fossil in the stratum except fossil X is 65 million years old is thus intrinsically less probable than the hypothesis that every fossil in the stratum is 65 million years old. This is because the former hypothesis is equivalent to a conjunction. 1. Every fossil in the stratum, not including fossil X, is 65 million years old. And 2. Fossil X is not 65 million years old. And yet, the truth of the first conjunct, 1, actually gives us good reason to expect the falsity of the second conjunct, 2. This means that the different elements of the hypothesis are actually in a kind of tension with one another. Given the first element of the hypothesis, the second element is rendered improbable or surprising. This, in turn, renders the hypothesis as a whole less probable prior to considering the data. This fact can actually be captured mathematically in the notion of probabilistic tension. We won't cover this in depth here, but we mention it for those who, like me, actually enjoy math. 
Seriously though, don't worry if these equations on the screen don't make much sense. I actually already explained it in a more informal and understandable manner. That, then, is the first response proponents of the Kalam can make to the objection at hand. The second and third responses are drawn from Josh Rasmussen's article, Does Every Beginning Have a Cause? So, as a second response, note again that a universal principle is simpler and hence intrinsically more likely than competing restricting ones. For example, the principle that all naturally occurring diamonds are clear is simpler than the principle that all naturally occurring diamonds are clear except those in dark, unexplored caves. So if we are to restrict the principle, then we need good reason to do so, otherwise we multiply restrictions beyond necessity. Unless and until the objector provides some principled, independent reason for restricting the causal principle to only things within the universe, or to only arrangements of things, we should adopt the unrestricted version. And keep in mind that not all differences are automatically relevant. In general, every inductive generalization will extend to a class C of unobserved things, and there will be differences between members of C and non-members. Merely citing these differences is not by itself enough to call a principle into question. To draw out this point, take again the principle that every naturally occurring diamond is clear. This principle is an extrapolation that goes beyond the naturally occurring diamonds that we've observed. It applies, for example, to diamonds produced in dark, unexplored caves. But suppose someone objects that we have no experience with diamonds produced in dark, unexplored caves. Hence, we have no motivation to conclude that diamonds produced in dark, unexplored caves will be clear, for we have never actually seen their color. Notice, however, that this objection rests on an unstated assumption. The assumption is that the location of diamonds produced in dark, unexplored caves would be relevant to their color. Now, being in a dark, unexplored cave is a difference between those unobserved diamonds and the diamonds that we have observed. But unless we have a reason to think that this difference is relevant, restricting the principle is simply unmotivated. And, importantly, whether or not something is within the universe, or whether or not something is an arrangement of things, just doesn't seem relevant to whether it has a cause of its beginning. The third and final response is that our evidence base isn't limited to our positive experiences of beginnings having causes. It also includes our lack of experience of uncaused beginnings. We observe right now, for instance, that random chunks of matter, both arrangements of things and simpler things that form arrangements, are not flooding into existence. Why don't they? No matter where we go or what time it is, we repeat this observation of causal order again and again. Our consistent observation of causal order, uninterrupted by, say, floods of simple particles coming into existence, is evidence. This evidence itself supports the simple universal principle that things, both arrangements of things and the simpler things that form arrangements, never come into existence uncaused. The burden, then, and as we've emphasized, is to provide an adequate reason to restrict the causal principle. For instance, one might reason that we've never actually experienced things beginning to exist. Instead, we merely have experience of already existent things being rearranged. Our inductive evidence base, therefore, only consists in seeing rearrangements of pre-existing stuff having a cause, and in that case, we should only be prepared to generalize that every rearrangement of pre-existing stuff has a cause. Two things can be said in response to this example. First, we know that some kinds of quarks, which are, as far as we currently know, not composed of simpler things, can turn into other kinds of quarks. This doesn't seem to be a case of already existent things being rearranged to form a new composite object. Instead, it's a case of a simple, fundamental particle beginning to exist. Second, many composite objects aren't merely arrangements of pre-existent things. For instance, I exist, but I'm not identical to an arrangement of a particular group of particles. For any particle you choose at random, you could replace that particle with a distinct but qualitative duplicate particle, and I wouldn't thereby cease to exist. I'm also constantly gaining and losing particles, and yet I obviously exist throughout that. So, given that many composite objects exist and aren't merely arrangements of pre-existent things, and given that we've seen many such composite objects begin to exist with causes, it follows that our experience supporting the Kalam's causal principle isn't merely of already existent things simply being rearranged. And upon reflection, this seems kind of obvious, really. I exist now, but I didn't exist a million years ago. Yeah, the particles that currently compose me probably existed a million years ago, but it's just absurd to say that I existed a million years ago. And what this means is that I began to exist, and so our evidence base does include things genuinely beginning to exist. Objections such as these urge us to refine and clarify what we mean when we say that we have no experience of things beginning to exist. 
One way of refining our point is to specify that we have no experience of material things coming into being from nothing. That is, we have no experience of material things beginning to exist without being made from pre-existing things or stuff. One might add, further, that this lack of experience is, indeed, a relevant difference between the beginnings within the universe and the beginnings of the universe itself, that is, the beginning of all of material reality. This relevant difference between the case, one might continue, is a reason to limit the scope of the causal principle. Consider again the case of naturally occurring diamonds, which we're hereon refer to as simply diamonds. While most would agree that it's reasonable to infer from the fact that all observed diamonds are clear that, probably, diamonds in dark, unexplored caves on Earth are clear, it's doubtful that most would agree that it's reasonable to infer that, probably, all diamonds whatsoever are clear. That is, that all diamonds across the observable and unobservable universe, on potentially billions of different celestial bodies, each accompanied by otherworldly pressures and environments, are also clear. While this altered analogy is no doubt imperfect, it serves to contextualise the fact that we've only experienced a tiny fraction of the universe, as well as a tiny fraction of its various scales. And yet, despite this, the Kalam causal principle beckons us to endorse a vast cosmological inference. More to the point, just as it's a live possibility that otherworldly pressures, temperatures and environments might serve as a relevant difference for diamonds and their transparency, perhaps something coming into being from nothing serves as a relevant difference for acquiring a cause, or so the detractor of the inductive argument might argue. Defenders of the inductive argument, in turn, will probably respond to the detractor by asking them the following question. What exactly is it about coming into being without being made from pre-existent stuff that could explain why that sort of beginning wouldn't require a cause, while other sorts of beginnings do? Remember, the burden is on the detractor to pinpoint and explain why there's a relevant difference that allows them to discriminate between cases. To successfully rebut the inductive argument, then, the detractor should be prepared to offer an answer to this question. Unfortunately, we don't have the space to pursue this particular dialectic further. We simply want to give you guys a sense of how the dialectic is likely to play out, as well as the various moves each party can make in it. Our principal goal here, again, is to equip you with the tools to think critically about these arguments for yourselves. The path to truth isn't easy. It's paved with arguments, objections, rejoinders, intuitions, clarifications, refinements, and so on. It takes courage to think for yourself, to think through the dialectic, and to reach a reasoned conclusion. But the reward is intellectual autonomy and a greater understanding of reality. In truth, one's personal web of beliefs is probably going to strongly influence which of the prior analogies you find befitting, as well as which side of the dialectic sketched above you're going to fall on. At least as far as we can see, though, there's room for reasonable disagreement here. But there is one final point to make before moving on. Even if we don't have adequate reason to restrict the principle itself, we certainly have good reason to exhibit intellectual humility when making sweeping inductive generalizations. In other words, we have good reason to limit our degree of confidence in the relevant inductive inference to the unrestricted principle. To illustrate this point, consider again the 17th century. Just as Europeans were mistaken to claim that all swans are white based on their limited geographical data, we today have only explored a tiny fraction of the observable universe as well as a tiny fraction of its various scales. Moreover, the discoveries we have made in the last century alone have significantly challenged, and in some cases completely overturned, what was previously extremely convincing inductive generalizations. Where we once believed that Earth will always be greeted by another sunrise, we now don't, courtesy of principled independent reasons. Where we once believed gravitational laws applied universally, we now think there are certain domains or contexts in which they break down. Inductive generalizations are quite defeasible, and so while they provide some reason to accept their conclusions, that reason is tentative. But speaking of principled independent reasons, it is to this suggestion that we turn next. A second response notes that both inductive generalizations and inferences to a universal principle as the best explanation for phenomena can be defeated if we have principled, independent reasons for making exceptions to an otherwise universal principle, or if we have reasons for thinking that our evidence base is unrepresentative of the space over which we're generalizing. One such principled reason might be the claim that causation is essentially a temporal relation. That is, that causes must bear some temporal relation to their effects, such as being earlier than or simultaneous with. 
If that's true, then if we assume, along with Craig, that time itself has a beginning and that there cannot be an infinite number of causes, it simply follows that time is something that begins to exist and yet cannot be caused to begin to exist. Absurd. 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 Daddy, chill. Now, it's important to note that this only serves as a principled reason for restricting the causal principle if we can support the claim that causation is essentially a temporal relation. Thus, if one wants to level this response, one needs to offer reasons favouring the temporal character of causation. One such reason could come precisely from inductive generalization. Because all observed causal relations are temporal, we can conclude that, probably, all causal relations are temporal. Yeah, what's source for the goose is source for the gander, to borrow one of Craig's favourite sayings. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. But there is another, less ambitious way to defeat the inductive and explanatory inferences to the causal principle. In particular, one can argue that it's simply not at all clear whether or not causation is an essentially temporal relation. If one can support this, then, assuming along with Craig that time has a beginning, we'll have good reason not to conclude that whatever begins to exist has a cause. More specifically, we'll have good reason to suspend judgment on whether the beginning of time itself has a cause, in which case we'll have reason not to accept the causal principle. An analogy might be helpful here. Imagine you're a doctor. You know that one of your patients has two conditions, A and B. You also know that condition B is normally associated with low blood sugar. Given just this information, you would have good inductive reason to think that the patient has low blood sugar. But now suppose you know some additional information. In particular, you know that it's unclear whether condition A raises blood sugar from low levels back to healthy levels. That is, you have reason to think it's not clear whether condition A counteracts the low blood sugar levels associated with condition B. With this additional information in hand, it seems obvious that you shouldn't automatically conclude that your patient has low blood sugar. The very fact that it's unclear whether condition A would counteract condition B's associated low blood sugar should lead you to suspend judgment on whether your patient has low blood sugar. Thus, if you know that it's unclear whether condition A counteracts condition B's associated low blood sugar, you shouldn't conclude from the fact that this patient has condition B, which is normally associated with low blood sugar, to the conclusion that this patient has low blood sugar. The inductive support that the former lends to the latter is undercut or undermined by the fact that it's unclear whether condition A counteracts condition B's associated low blood sugar. But now transfer this reasoning to the case of the causal principle. We know that beginnings are normally associated with causes. Given just this information, we would have good inductive reason to conclude that some unobserved beginning, say the beginning of time, likewise has a cause. But now suppose you know some additional information. In particular, you know that it's unclear whether causation is an expressly temporal relation. With this additional information in hand, it seems obvious that you shouldn't automatically conclude that the beginning of time has a cause. This is because the only thing that could cause the beginning of time is something timeless, which in turn requires that causation is not an expressly temporal relation. If then you know that it's unclear whether causation is an expressly temporal relation, you shouldn't conclude from the fact that beginnings normally have causes, to the conclusion that the beginning of time has a cause. The inductive support that the former lends to the latter is thus undercut or undermined by the fact that it's unclear whether causation is an expressly temporal relation. Thus, if we have independent reason to think it's unclear whether causation is an essentially temporal relation, then we ought to suspend judgment on the inductive and explanatory inferences to the causal principle. And in that case, the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle don't succeed. Now, exploring the debate on whether causation is an essentially temporal relation would take us too far afield given present purposes. Suffice it to note that if you can support that claim, or else show that it's unclear whether the claim is true, you will have defeated the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle. A third response to the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle is that there are principles incompatible with the Kalam, or traditional theism more generally, that are equally supported by induction and inference to the best explanation. Consider some of the principles that we explored in our previous episode. 1. Every material object that begins to exist has a material cause, that is, some stuff from which it is made. Another principle is that, Causes must either be before or simultaneous with their effects, and yet another is, every case of mental causation is durational. That is, whenever a mind produces an effect, the mind undergoes some temporal process in doing so. 
Each of these principles is constantly confirmed in our experience. They've proved fruitful in both scientific practice and ordinary reasoning. They're each incredibly simple and elegant hypotheses that successfully predict and explain our widespread empirical support for them, and so on. If one believes the Kalam causal principles for such reasons, it seems that one should also believe these principles for such reasons. And yet, as we saw in our previous episode, believing these principles requires us giving up the Kalam and or traditional theism. One might, of course, claim that one or more of these principles are defeated by the arguments for the finitude of the past, perhaps together with the Kalam's causal principle or an analysis of the characteristics of the cause of the universe. Craig, for instance, says the following. The principle that everything that comes into existence has a material cause, if it has a cause at all, is indeed powerfully supported by inductive evidence. But it gets defeated by the evidence for the beginning of the universe, which cannot have a material cause. Oh, and uh, by the way... That clip is from Craig's response to Skydive Phil's Kalam documentary, and if you want a brilliant takedown of Craig's four-part response to the documentary, look no further than Nathan Ormond and James Fodor's recent Bad Apologetics episode featuring Skydive Phil and philosopher of physics Daniel Linford. They pick apart Craig's response with masterful skill, so you're in for a major treat if you watch it. But back to Craig's response. According to Craig, the principle that for whatever begins to exist has a material cause, if it has a cause at all, is defeated by the evidence for the beginning of the universe. But it's not hard to see why this response is thoroughly unconvincing. First, we could equally say that the evidence for the beginning of the universe is itself defeated by the powerful inductive, experiential, and explanatory support for Principle 4. Second, while material cause might suggest matter and energy, we actually defined it as the things or stuff from which something is made. This need not be matter or energy. It might be the case, for instance, that there is a non-material entity that causes the universe to begin to exist by transforming itself in some way or partitioning itself off in some manner. What this means is that Craig is simply wrong to insist that Principle 4 is incompatible with the beginning of the universe and matter more generally. Third, the beginning of the universe is perfectly compatible with Principle 4. This principle could be true if the universe begins to exist without a material cause, since the latter is compatible with the universe having no cause whatsoever. In which case, we have no violation of the principle that whatever begins to exist has a material cause if it has a cause at all. And so Craig is simply wrong to say that the evidence for the beginning of the universe defeats Principle 4. Now, Craig might of course claim that Principle 4 is, after all, incompatible with such evidence, together with the Kalam's causal principle, and so we should reject Principle 4 on this basis. But again, we could equally say that the evidence, together with Principle 4, is incompatible with the Kalam's causal principle, and that we should therefore reject the Kalam's causal principle on this basis. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Overall then, we don't think Craig has dealt any serious blows to the criticism from Kalam-unfriendly principles. We should also keep in mind that there are lots of other Kalam-unfriendly and or theism-unfriendly principles that compared to the Kalam's causal principle, seem equally supported by induction and inference to the best explanation. We'll consider two such principles here. 5. Every concrete object has a cause. Know that something is concrete just in case it's able to cause something. This principle is even simpler than the Kalam's causal principle, and it's just as empirically confirmed. Induction therefore supports it just as much as the Kalam's causal principle. Moreover, it provides an illuminating explanation of why everything concrete in our experience has a cause. But, of course, it's incompatible with both traditional theism and the Kalam. It's incompatible with traditional theism because it implies that God has a cause, which traditional theism denies. And it's incompatible with the Kalam because if everything concrete has a cause, then for any arbitrary concrete thing X, it was caused by X1, which was caused by X2, which was caused by X3, and so on ad infinitum. And this infinite regress violates both the new Kalam's commitment to causal finitism, as well as the philosophical case for premise 2 of the old Kalam. It's also interesting to note that Principle 5 is compatible with the Kalam's causal principle. The Kalam's causal principle, after all, just says that whatever begins to exist has a cause. This is compatible with everything concrete that doesn't begin to exist requiring a cause as well. Given that Principle 5 actually predicts the truth of the Kalam's causal principle, moreover, if the latter is true, it actually provides evidence for the former's truth as well. Now, one might think that there are independent reasons to reject this principle that don't apply to the Kalam's causal principle. We'll briefly consider two such reasons. First, consider the totality of everything concrete, 
this totality can't have a cause, for any such cause would itself be part of the totality, since the totality includes everything concrete, and by definition anything that has causal power is concrete. But if the cause is itself part of the totality, it cannot be what causally produced the entire totality to begin with, for then it would be causally producing itself, and nothing can causally produce itself. After all, in order to causally bring itself into existence, it would have had to have already existed, and so its existence would have been prior to itself, which is absurd. But this first reason isn't convincing. First, it assumes that the totality of everything actually exists as a concrete object. But why should we think that? Why think there is this thing or object called the totality of everything that exists over and above the particular objects within the totality? Indeed, this just seems like a deeply implausible assumption. Just as there is nothing composed exactly of Donald Trump's left ear, my big toe, the Eiffel Tower, and the city of New York, there's nothing composed of absolutely everything concrete. And even if there were such a thing, it's not at all clear that it would be a concrete object, as opposed to some amalgamation or collection of objects which is not itself an object. Second, even if such a totality actually exists, and even if it counts as a concrete object, we can avoid the issue of self-causation by modifying the original principle as follows. 5 star. Every concrete object has a partly causal explanation for why it exists. This too is incompatible with theism, since God can't even have a partly causal explanation for why he exists. God, after all, is entirely uncaused. And crucially, it avoids the self-causation problem, since the totality of everything concrete can have a partly causal explanation in terms of something within the totality without this partial cause being self-caused. Consider that part of the reason why the totality exists is because I exist. After all, if I didn't exist, the specific totality of everything concrete that actually exists wouldn't itself exist. It would instead be a different totality made up of different things. Thus, whatever caused my existence partly causally explains why the totality of everything exists. It doesn't, of course, wholly explain it, but it does offer a partial or incomplete causal explanation of it. And none of this requires self-causation. It simply requires that something caused me to exist. And that's obviously true, right? My parents caused me to exist. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Just, Just the, the tips? tips? I can't believe we're doing this. I know, we're so naughty. But, but let's get back on track by considering the second reason one might offer against principle five that allegedly breaks its symmetry with the Kalam's causal principle. This second reason is that principle 5, unlike the Kalam's causal principle, seems to imply an infinite past, for if every concrete object has a cause, then any concrete object x was caused by 1x, which was caused by 2x, which was caused by 3x, and so on ad infinitum into the infinite past. And yet an infinite past, so the thought goes, is absurd. Thus, we have a symmetry breaker between principle 5 and the Kalam's causal principle. But this second reason isn't convincing either. First, it's just false that Principle 5 entails an infinite past. In other words, Principle 5 is perfectly compatible with a finite past. Just imagine that the earliest second of temporal reality is structured like the following. An object comes into existence at the first second, which was caused by an object that came into existence at the first half second, which was caused by an object that came into existence at the first quarter of a second, which was caused by an object that came into existence at the first eighth of a second, and so on. In such a situation, we can suppose that every concrete object has a cause. Nevertheless, the past is finite in such a situation. Thus, Principle 5 is entirely compatible with a finite past. What's more, Principle 5 could be true even if there was a temporally first concrete object that came into existence and was caused by a timeless concrete object. This timeless concrete object must simply itself be caused by another timeless object, which in turn was caused by another timeless object, and so on ad infinitum. This is yet another reason why Principle 5 is perfectly compatible with a finite past. Note though that this second situation does require that causation isn't an essentially temporal relation. But assuming the Kalam shows that time itself began to exist, the claim that causation isn't essentially temporal is already granted by the Kalam proponent, and so appealing it to it here is perfectly kosher. Second, even if Principle 5 entails an infinite past, the response in question is a dangerous move. Taking it renders the arguments from induction and inference to the best explanation for the causal principle parasitic on arguments against the infinite past. If those arguments fail, as we'll argue that they do in future episodes, then it would follow that the arguments from induction and inference to the best explanation for the causal principle likewise fail.
This is also why it would be dangerous to use, say, causal finitism, or the alleged impossibility of actual infinites as a symmetry breaker between principle 5 and the Kalam's causal principle. Third, if we grant, again hypothetically, that principle 5 entails an infinite past, and is thus incompatible with the standard arguments employed for the past's finitude, it would be a mistake to simply reject the principle. For principle 5 itself can provide grounds for rejecting those arguments for the finitude of the past. The very fact that principle 5 enjoys powerful inductive, experiential, and explanatory support gives us reason to reject the arguments for the finitude of the past. Whether the reason is all things considered convincing is another matter, of course, but it's undeniable that it gives us some reason here. Again, assuming, as we shouldn't, that Principle 5 entails an infinite past. That then caps off Principle 5, which leads us to Principle 6. Every event is temporally preceded by another event. This principle is a simple, elegant generalization from our universal experience of events. After all, every event we've observed is preceded by another event, and so we have powerful inductive support for principle 6. Moreover, a simple and illuminating explanation for these universal observations is that it's simply in the nature of events to come after other events. But, of course, principle 6 is incompatible with the Kalam, since it implies an infinite temporal regress of events. Again, one might say that the inductive and explanatory arguments for Principle 6 are simply defeated by the arguments against infinite temporal regresses. But as before, this is a perilous move. Taking it renders the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle parasitic on the arguments against infinite temporal regresses. And we've already seen why this is dangerous for the proponent of the Kalam. Moreover, it would be a mistake to simply reject Principle 6 because it conflicts with arguments against infinite temporal regresses. Even if you think those arguments are plausible, you need to weigh this against the powerful inductive, experiential, and explanatory grounds for accepting Principle 6. In other words, the support for Principle 6 is itself a reason to reject those arguments. Again, whether it's an all-things-considered reason to reject those arguments will depend on your particular epistemic situation. But it's a reason nonetheless. That then caps off Principle 6. Again, much more can be said both on this principle and other Kalam unfriendly principles more generally. For purpose of space, though, what we've said here suffices. To sum up our second response, we've argued that if one believes the Kalam's causal principle based on induction and inference to the best explanation, it seems one should also believe principles 1 through 6 for precisely the same reasons. And yet, as we've seen, believing these principles requires giving up the Kalam. Of course, an alternative option would involve showing why we should prefer the Kalam causal principle over the array of Kalam unfriendly principles. But, as we explained in our previous episode, this would be an exceedingly difficult feat, and the burden is on the proponent of the Kalam to meet it. A final response specifically targets the inductive argument for the causal principle. The response is that the inductive argument commits the fallacy of composition, that is, the fallacy of assuming that the whole has some feature simply because its parts have that feature. The idea is that the argument infers that the beginning of the whole universe has a cause simply because the beginning of everything within the universe, that is, every part of the universe, has a cause. But this is clearly a fallacy. Just because every individual particle composing me, say, is invisible, we clearly can't infer that I am invisible. What to make of this response? Well, notice that the inductive argument isn't actually an inference from the properties of parts to the properties of their whole. Instead, it's just a simple inductive generalization of the following form. First, we have good reason to think that all observed things that begin to exist have causes. Together with the defeasible inductive principle that if all observed f's have property p, then probably all f's have property p, we can infer that, probably, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The argument, then, is as follows, where the property in question is the property of having a cause. All observed things that begin to exist have causes. If all observed f's have property p, then probably every f has property p. So, probably, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Notice that there isn't any inference here from the properties of parts to the properties of wholes. Premise 2 is simply an inductive rule of inference widely used in scientific, philosophical, and ordinary reasoning. Premise 1 simply notes the causal order and regularity we see around us. We don't witness things coming into being all willy-nilly, with no cause whatsoever. And of course, the conclusion simply follows from the premises. Thus, the fallacy of composition charge is misguided.
But perhaps we can charitably understand the fallacy of composition charge as saying that there is a relevant difference between our inductive evidence base on the one hand and the space over which we want to generalize on the other. Our inductive evidence base includes our ordinary experience of beginnings together with the beginnings of very small and very large things observed using scientific instruments. But the space over which we want to generalize includes absolutely everything that begins to exist, including the whole of space-time itself if it began to exist. But, so the thought goes, there are relevant differences between the whole of space-time and things within space-time when it comes to having a cause of their existence. In particular, any candidate cause of time itself must be timeless, whereas this isn't true of the causes of things within space-time. Furthermore, one might think, causation is essentially a temporal relation, or, at the very least, a timeless cause cannot issue in a temporal effect. If one can justify either of these claims, or even show that it's unclear whether the claims are true, then one will indeed have defeated the inductive argument for the causal principle. Notice, however, that this is essentially the second response to the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle that we already covered. We therefore have the following situation here. The fallacy of composition charge, on a natural interpretation, is simply mistaken, since the inductive argument for the causal principle doesn't make any inference from the properties of parts to the properties of wholes. But on a charitable interpretation, the fallacy of composition charge reduces to the second response we already considered. Those who want to level the fallacy of composition charge are therefore advised to check out our second response to the inductive and explanatory arguments. We also direct them to our first response, wherein we discuss restricted principles and probabilistic tension. Well done, legends. You got through the episode. If your head hurts, then, well, join the club. Before recapping, a few hearty thank yous are in order. First and foremost, of course, a huge thank you to Joe Schmid of the Majesty of Reason for this absurdly awesome ongoing collaboration. I want to again urge everyone to check out his channel and the playlist link below. You won't regret it. And a very special thanks to Josh Rasmussen, who, in addition to being both brilliant and kind, was generous enough to offer some feedback on portions of our script. And I just want to reiterate what Joe's just said, and that is a big thank you to you, Josh, for all of your work, for you helping out with this series, and, uh, well, just for all that you've done for the entire community. So, thank you very much. Alrighty, let's recap. We began our episode by focusing on the causal principle expressed in the Kalam's first premise, according to which whatever begins to exist has a cause. We also gave a bird's eye view of five reasons for the causal principle and five reasons against the causal principle that we'll be covering in our series. We then explained two key concepts for the episode. First, induction, which reasons that because all observed Fs have property P, probably all Fs have property P. And second, inference to the best explanation, which reasons that an explanation is probably true because it provides not only a good explanation of the data, but the best explanation available for it. Next, we explain the arguments for the causal principle based on induction and inference to the best explanation. The first argument, in short, is that every observed beginning to exist has a cause, so probably everything that begins to exist has a cause. The second argument, again in short, is that the causal principle provides the best explanation of our experiential data concerning beginnings to exist. We subsequently examined four responses to the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle. The first response is that there are reasons for restricting or limiting the scope of the causal principle. The second response is that the inductive and explanatory arguments for the causal principle face defeaters. In other words, various considerations undermine the inductive and explanatory support for the causal principle. The third response is that induction and inference to the best explanation equally support principles that are incompatible with the Kalam and or traditional theism. As we saw, induction and inference to the best explanation arguably do more harm than good for the Kalam. The fourth and the final response is that the inductive argument for the causal principle commits a fallacy of composition. We pointed out that on a natural reading, this response is mistaken, and on a charitable reading, it reduces to the second response we considered. And that is all she wrote. Thank you all again for the view, really appreciate it, and look forward to seeing you in the comments on the next one. Thanks. All right, I hope you liked that episode, and now we are on to the argument from chaos. This is the final video that I'm going to be including within this video. It's videoception, and once more, here's the script for patrons. If something can come into being from nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't come into being from nothing.
Think about it. Why don't bicycles and Beethoven, why so serious, and root beer come into being out of nothing? Why is it only universes that can come into being from nothing? What makes nothingness so discriminatory? There can't be anything about nothingness that favors universes, for nothingness doesn't have any properties. Nor can anything constrain nothingness, since there isn't anything to be constrained. Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well, and that an Inuit village hasn't popped into existence from under your feet, cause that would probably hurt, let's be honest. And likewise to our previous video, we're today going to examine premise 1 of stage 1 of the Old Kalam, or as it's also called, the causal principle. Whatever begins to exist, has a cause. And more specifically, we're going to delve into an argument that states that if the causal principle is false, so that things can just come into existence uncaused, then it becomes inexplicable. Why just anything and everything doesn't come into being from nothing? Think about it. And we will think about it, all throughout this episode, in fact. So, without further ado, let's get chaotic. As we've said, the heart and soul of this episode is the argument from chaos for premise one of the Kalam. The reason we call it the argument from chaos should be clear upon understanding the argument. As William Lane Craig puts it, and this should sound familiar, If things really could come into being uncaused out of nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything does not come into existence uncaused from nothing. Why do bicycles and Beethoven and root beer not pop into existence from nothing? Why is it only universes that can come into being from nothing? What makes nothingness so discriminatory? There cannot be anything about nothingness that favours universes. For nothingness does not have any properties. Nothingness is the absence of anything whatsoever. As such, nothingness can have no properties, since there literally is not anything to have any properties. Nor can anything constrain nothingness, for there is not anything to be constrained. Now, the form of the argument isn't very clear from Craig's remark, but we can put his reductio ad absurdum as follows. 1. If the causal principle is false, then uncaused chaos would pervade reality. 2. Uncaused chaos doesn't pervade reality. Conclusion, so the causal principle is true. The idea is that if not everything that begins to exist has a cause, then we have no explanation for why chaos doesn't pervade reality. That is, why things don't spring into existence willy-nilly, uncaused, with no rhyme or reason. And so since something absurd and clearly false follows from denying the causal principle, it follows, so concludes Craig, that it must be the case that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Other authors give slightly different versions of the argument from chaos. We'll discuss Andrew Loke's version in the next episode in our series. For this episode, we'll cover Proust and Rasmussen's version of the argument from chaos in their book Necessary Existence. Now, note that they actually offer an argument from chaos for another principle in a slightly different context, but what they say can easily be modified to apply to the Kalam's causal principle. What then is their argument? Well, they begin by arguing that the causal principle provides a simple, illuminating explanation of why there isn't unpredictable chaos all the time. Chaos results if arbitrary objects regularly begin to exist, uncaused, practically everywhere around us. We don't observe that happening, of course. But why not? Well, Proust and Rasmussen offer a simple answer. It just can't. After all, if uncaused beginnings are genuinely impossible, then objects can't come into being unless there are prior causal conditions from which they may arise. Thus, in the absence of such causal conditions, arbitrary chaotic masses of objects simply cannot come into being around us at any moment. According to Proust and Rasmussen, the causal principle, which states that beginnings require causes, is therefore a simple, illuminating, and predictively successful explanation of why chaos doesn't pervade reality. Now suppose instead that uncaused beginnings really are possible. So, for instance, it's possible for there to be, let's say, a pair of protons that begin to exist without a cause then it would seem that any number of uncaused beginnings would be possible. After all, it would be really strange if instead there were some precise finite number of things that could begin to exist without a cause. Like, oh, exactly 13 of them can begin uncaused, but no more. That just seems really implausible. So, plausibly, if two protons, say, can appear without a cause, then so could three, and four, and five, and so on for any number. 
Suppose further that there are infinitely many possible things that can begin at any given time, such as protons or electrons or photons. Then we can wonder why countless uncaused beginnings are not a common phenomenon. After all, at any moment, any number of arbitrary mixes of possible objects can snap into being with no cause whatsoever. Thus, if uncaused beginnings really are possible, it's extremely surprising that we don't witness untold numbers of arbitrary objects coming into existence uncaused. Having covered two variations of the argument from chaos, let's now turn our attention to responses to the argument. The first response one can offer is that there are other ways to rule out uncaused chaos that don't require any causal principle. Here, we'll discuss just three ways. The first way of ruling out chaos is by holding that both that co-location is impossible and that the relevant spaces that uncaused things might occupy upon springing into existence are already occupied. For if the relevant spaces are already occupied, say by chunks of matter or energy or quantum vacuums or whatever, and if co-location is impossible, then it simply cannot be the case that things like bicycles, Beethoven and root beer can chaotically come into existence uncaused. These things would have to take up space that's already occupied. So, providing that material objects can't occupy exactly the same space, we have a straightforward explanation for why uncaused chaos doesn't pervade reality. Notice, moreover, that this explanation doesn't appeal to any causal principle whatsoever. Defenders of the argument from chaos can respond that uncaused beginnings need not involve material objects co-locating, and so merely ruling out co-location won't be enough to prevent chaos. Examples of uncaused beginnings that don't involve material objects co-locating might be the uncaused and chaotic gain or loss of physical properties. For example, the spins of particles changing without a cause, or uncaused changes in the strength of electric fields, or uncaused excitations of quantum fields, etc. A second response that defenders of the argument from chaos might express would be that even if co-location is impossible, and even if uncaused beginnings could only involve co-location, chaos still wouldn't be prevented. For if things could begin to exist uncaused, then surely things could also cease to exist uncaused, because there doesn't seem to be a relevant difference between the beginnings and ceasings when it comes to requiring a cause. And in that case, we're faced with the question of why material things don't chaotically and causelessly cease to exist, thereby leaving their spatial positions vacant for chaotic comings into being. Chaos also wouldn't be prevented for yet another reason, namely that for all this first way of debarring chaos says, Spatial regions themselves might come into existence uncaused in between actual fully occupied spatial regions. Ruling out co-location fails to rule out this chaotic scenario. In response, one might of course add various auxiliary hypotheses to circumvent these problems. For instance, one could add that the gain and loss of properties requires a cause, that ceasing to exist requires a cause, and that spatial regions cannot come into existence in between actual fully occupied spatial regions but this only increases the complexity of the explanation while rendering it far less unifying and illuminating. Though, it should be noted that the Kalam causal principle, by itself, also doesn't explain why things don't chaotically and causelessly cease to exist, so that principle too needs to be supplemented if we want to give an adequate explanation of causal order. Let's now consider a second way to rule out chaos, namely by holding that certain physical laws prevent the uncaused coming into being of objects like bicycles, Beethoven, and root beer. Given the existence of such laws, no physical object or property could just spring into existence or out of existence uncaused. Examples of such laws might be the conservation laws of physics, which state that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed in isolated systems. Defenders of the argument from chaos can respond in several ways. First, it seems plausible that physical laws are merely descriptive in import. That is, they don't push and pull and cause and prevent things from happening. Instead, they merely describe either regularities in space-time or else the causal powers and dispositions of spatiotemporal entities. And if the laws are merely descriptive, then they won't do the explanatory work of preventing chaos, since then the laws are dependent on the character of things within space-time, and so whether or not space-time is filled with uncaused chaos would be explanatorily prior to, and hence unable to be explained by, the laws. In short, defenders of the argument from chaos might argue that laws don't have any special or spooky power on their own to prevent chaos. Proponents of the physical law explanation for ruling out chaos will probably respond in turn by adopting a view of physical laws on which they're not merely descriptive in import, but instead they enjoy some sort of explanatory preventative power. This will, though, increase the complexity of the explanation, 
and would spiral into rejoinders that exceed our purpose here. A second response on behalf of the argument from chaos is that appealing to laws won't, after all, forbid chaos, since we're then left with a question of why those very laws don't cease to exist uncaused, or why entirely different physical laws don't spring into existence uncaused. We simply push the need to prevent chaos back to the level of the laws themselves. One might, of course, add the auxiliary hypothesis that physical laws can't begin nor cease to exist uncaused, this does, however, increase the complexity of the explanation, and it also raises further explanatory questions needing answered. Why, for instance, do physical laws require causes to begin to exist, whereas physical things don't? What's the relevant difference between them? Without answers to these questions, the explanatory power of the proffered explanation will be diminished. Let's consider a third way to rule out chaos without invoking the causal principle. Just as the proponent of the argument from chaos cites a metaphysical principle to explain why chaos doesn't pervade reality, the opponent of the argument can do the same. In particular, the opponent of chaos can posit the following principle. Transfer principle. Matter and energy can only enter a system through the transfer of matter or energy from surrounding systems. Notice that this principle, like the causal principle, nicely explains why chaos doesn't pervade reality. For instance, the transfer principle entails that it's simply impossible for a raging tiger to causelessly spring into existence right in front of me. That's because such an occurrence would involve matter and energy entering into a system without being transferred from an adjacent system. The same applies to Beethoven, bicycles and root beer causelessly springing into existence without any physical system. Such is impossible given the transfer principle. But what about the chaotic and causeless gain or loss of various properties in physical systems? Well, we can explain why that kind of chaos doesn't pervade reality by invoking a second principle. Change principle. Changes in a physical system must depend, in part, on 1. The system gaining or losing matter or energy, or else 2. The transfer of matter or energy between the system's subsystems. Together with the transfer principle, we have an explanation as to why physical systems don't randomly or causelessly gain or lose properties, for according to the change principle, those sorts of changes need to happen because of matter or energy entering either the system itself or one of its subsystems. But as we've seen, according to the transfer principle, that can't chaotically happen uncaused. We therefore debar widespread chaos concerning the gain or loss of various properties. Importantly, moreover, the transfer principle and the change principle, both individually and taken together, plainly do not entail the causal principle. Both the transfer and change principles, for instance, are entirely compatible with the universe itself beginning to exist uncaused. For such a beginning wouldn't involve some matter or energy entering a physical system, but would instead represent the very beginning of any physical system at all. The transfer principle is therefore silent on whether there could be such an occurrence. The change principle is similarly silent, since the beginning of the universe wouldn't involve a change within any physical system, since there was no pre-given physical system that underwent any change. We therefore seem to have on our hands a perfectly respectable alternative explanation of why chaos doesn't pervade reality. An explanation, importantly, that neither invokes nor implies the causal principle. Now, at this juncture, the proponent of the argument from chaos might allege that there is simply no reason to accept the transfer and change principles. But this reply is confused. First, regardless of whether there is reason to accept the principles, what matters is that they show that Craig is simply mistaken in saying that if the causal principle is false, then it's inexplicable why chaos doesn't pervade reality. For the transfer and change principles are perfectly compatible with the falsity of the causal principle, but nevertheless provide an explanation for why chaos doesn't pervade reality. In principle, then, it could be the case that the causal principle is false, and yet there's an explanation for why chaos doesn't pervade reality. And so Craig is simply wrong to insist that if the causal principle is false, then the absence of chaos is inexplicable. Second, this reply just misunderstands who has the burden of proof in the current dialectic. The burden of proof is on proponents of the argument from chaos to positively justify their claim that the absence of chaos gives us good reason to accept the causal principle. This, in turn, means that the burden is on them to show that either one, if the causal principle is false, then either there would be chaos or else it would be inexplicable why there's no chaos, or else, too, despite the fact that there are alternative explanations for why there's no chaos, we should accept the explanation based on the causal principle. We've already seen why one is mistaken. And as far as we're aware, proponents of the argument from chaos have yet to make a case for two. But the crucial thing to see here is the following. It just doesn't matter in the current context whether or not there are positive reasons favoring the transfer and change principles. The burden, again, is on the proponent of the argument from chaos 
to provide positive reasons for accepting the causal principle as an explanation of why there's no chaos, as opposed to simply adopting the transfer and change principles instead as an explanation thereof. Third, there actually are lots of reasons to believe the transfer and change principles. At least by our lights, they're both intuitively plausible, which is a reason that Kalam proponents themselves tend to cite in favor of the causal principle. Moreover, the transfer and change principles are exceptionally empirically confirmed, and they also successfully predict the truth of conservation laws in physics. Finally, like the causal principle, they seem to offer a relatively simple and illuminating explanation for why chaos doesn't pervade reality. Lastly, the defender of the argument from chaos might reply that there's still residual chaos that this maneuver fails to rule out. For instance, even if we respect the constraint that matter and energy must be transferred between systems or subsystems, this transfer might itself happen in a chaotic, uncaused fashion, and hence the two principles we've canvassed fail to rule out boatloads of random, uncaused transfers of matter and energy between systems. It therefore fails to rule out this residual chaos. But this reply rests on a misunderstanding of the word transfer. As we intend the two principles to be understood, matter-energy transference is itself a causal process. As we're understanding it, for matter or energy to be transferred between systems or subsystems just is for something to bring about that transfer. The proponent of the argument from chaos will likely reply in turn that there's no relevant difference between transference of matter or energy between systems or subsystems on the one hand, and matter or energy beginning to exist, on the other hand, when it comes to requiring a cause. If this is correct, then if the former requires a cause, the latter does too. Note, though, that it isn't enough merely to suggest that there is no relevant difference here. The proponent of the argument from chaos needs to roll up their sleeves and actually establish that. Whew. Okay, we made it through the section. It's technical, I know, but it's also deeply rewarding for that very reason. The overall lesson of this section is that there may very well be other ways to rule out uncaused chaos that don't require the Kalam's causal principle, which in turn means that defenders of the argument from chaos at least have much more work to do if they want us to accept their particular solution to the problem of preventing chaos. A second response to the argument from chaos is that the fully general causal principle isn't needed to rule out chaos, since restricted causal principles, ones that don't allow us to run the Kalam, mind you, do the job just as well. Consider the following principles that, even together with the claim that the universe began to exist, don't allow us to infer that the universe has a cause, but that nevertheless seems to prevent chaos in the world around us. 1. Everything in the universe that begins to exist requires a cause. 2. Every non-first thing that begins to exist requires a cause. And 3. Everything contingent that begins to exist requires a cause. By the way, By the way something is contingent if it exists but can fail to exist. By contrast, something is necessary if it cannot fail to exist. Following Graham Oppie, one can add to this third principle that 1. The initial state of the universe is by nature necessarily existent and has the power to indeterministically cause various non-first states of the universe. And 2. Every possible non-initial state of the universe is by nature contingent. An indeterministic cause, by the way, is a cause whose presence doesn't necessitate a specific effect among the range of possible effects it might produce. Now, here are some important things to notice. Principle 1, together with the second premise of the Kalam, doesn't entail that the universe itself has a cause. And yet, Principle 1 does entail that it's impossible for things to pop into existence uncaused within the universe, and so it prevents chaos. Similarly, Principle 2 doesn't entail that the first thing, say, the first material object that came into existence at the alleged beginning of the universe, has a cause. And yet it does entail that it's impossible for non-first things to pop into existence uncaused, and so it prevents chaos. Likewise, Principle 3, together with the Kalam's second premise, doesn't entail that the universe has a cause, since the principle is compatible with there being a necessarily existent initial state of the universe with no cause, if, of course, there is such a state. How might defenders of the argument from chaos respond? Well, we need to distinguish between alternative principles and competing principles, a point that came up in our previous episode as well. Notice that principles 1 through 3 are entirely compatible with the more general causal principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause. They therefore don't compete with the general causal principle. So, if you have no reason to think that a whole universe that begins to exist cannot have a cause, no reason to think that a first thing that begins to exist cannot have a cause, and no reason to think that a necessary thing that begins to exist cannot have a cause, then the truth of the principles 1 through 3 would actually be quite strong evidence in favor of the Kalam's causal principle. 
This is because the Kalam's causal principle successfully predicts their truth. To give an analogy, evidence that every other kind of rock is durable is evidence that this kind of rock is durable. Absent some reason to think that this kind of rock isn't durable, that is, absent some reason to think that this kind of rock either is or very well may be relevantly different from the other kinds of rocks with respect to durability, we have good reason to think that this kind of rock is also durable. When the principles don't compete, and when one lacks independent reason to discriminate between the cases, evidence for the one is plausibly evidence for the other. To avoid this response, one might try to add to each of principles 1 through 3 that nothing else requires a cause. But this move only increases the complexity of the principles and lowers their probability by creating probabilistic tension between their components, something we explained in depth in our previous video. What's more, this move doesn't seem to be a worse explanation of why chaos doesn't pervade reality than the more general causal principles used in the Kalam. For with restricted principles, we are faced with the question of why there are those particular restrictions and not others. What's the relevant difference between first things and non-first things, or necessary things and non-necessary things? What's more, this move seems to be a worse explanation of why chaos doesn't pervade reality than the more general causal principle used in the Kalam. For with restricted principles, we're faced with a question of why there are those particular restrictions and not others. What's the relevant difference between first things and non-first things, or necessary things and contingent things, or universes and things within universes that could explain why only the latter require causes of their coming into existence? The move in question then seems to multiply mystery rather than remove it. The Kalam's causal principle is thus simpler, more explanatory, and doesn't suffer from probabilistic tension when compared with the restricted principles. And in reply to this point, opponents of the argument from chaos will probably respond in two ways. First, they'll probably try to pinpoint precisely such relevant differences. For instance, if one can support the claim that causation is essentially a temporal relation, then one will have a principled explanation for the restrictions on the causal principle. We actually examined inductive, explanatory, and intuition-based reasoning for thinking causation is essentially temporal in our previous two episodes. But alas, exploring the nature of causation extends far beyond the scope of this video. We just wanted to give you guys a sense of the dialectic. The second response is that even granting these points about complexity, probabilistic tension, and so on, the very fact that restricted principles successfully debar chaos still shows that some versions of the argument from chaos fail. For instance, Craig's version argues that if the causal principle were false, then it's inexplicable why chaos doesn't pervade reality. But the restricted principles show that this is simply mistaken. For the restricted principles are perfectly compatible with the falsity of the causal principle, but nevertheless provide an explanation of why chaos doesn't pervade reality. In principle, then, it could be the case that the causal principle is false, and yet we have an explanation for why chaos doesn't pervade reality. And so Craig is simply mistaken to insist that if the causal principle is false, then it's inexplicable why chaos doesn't pervade reality. The third response to the argument from chaos is that it problematically overgeneralizes. For the argument can be applied with appropriate modifications and no seeming loss of plausibility to the Kalam advocate's view that timeless entities don't require a cause. We can equally ask, if things really could timelessly exist uncaused, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't exist timelessly uncaused. Why don't changeless bicycles and root beer not timelessly exist uncaused? Or why don't timeless universal wave functions of various kinds not exist uncaused? Or why don't various lower deities not timelessly exist uncaused? Why is it only some entities, such as God, that can timelessly exist with no cause? The idea is essentially the same as the original argument from Chaos. If not everything that timelessly exists has a cause, then we have no explanation for why Chaos doesn't pervade timeless reality. That is, why whole jungles of arbitrary timeless things don't exist willy-nilly, uncaused, with no rhyme or reason. But echoing Craig, that seems absurd. Hence, everything timeless has a cause. We can similarly run Proust and Rasmussen's version of the argument with respect to timeless things. Suppose that uncaused timeless things are genuinely possible. Well, then it would seem that any number of uncaused timeless things would be possible. It would be really strange if instead there were some precise finite number of things that could timelessly exist without a cause. Moreover, if a timeless god could exist with no cause, then surely whole swaths of other timeless things could likewise exist with no cause. In short, we'd get arbitrary and chaotic swaths of timeless things existing uncaused. And yet, surely that's absurd. The argument from chaos, then, might be a double-edged sword. 
If one wants to prevent temporal chaos by appealing to a causal principle, then it seems that one should also prevent timeless chaos by appealing to a causal principle. But, of course, the Kalam proponent can't do that, since that would entail saying that God requires a cause. The argument from chaos, then, seems ultimately to be incompatible with the Kalam, or at least with theism. Now, defenders of the argument from chaos will probably respond that, unlike any other thing, whether temporal or timeless, God is simply the kind of thing that can't have a cause. But opponents will counter that this is precisely what they're saying about the initial state of the universe, if there is one. While everything else is the kind of thing that requires a cause, the initial state of the universe is simply the kind of thing that can't have a cause. Defenders of the argument from chaos can respond, in turn, that they actually have an explanation for why God isn't the kind of thing that could have a cause. Here's a potential explanation. By nature, God is perfect, and plausibly a perfect being wouldn't receive its existence from something else. Such dependence on another for everything that one has just seems incompatible with being perfect. It seems to be an imperfection, in other words. Thus, God isn't the kind of thing that could, in principle, have a cause. Alternatively, the explanation could say that being the source of everything apart from oneself is plausibly a perfection or a great-making feature, and God, as a perfect being, by definition has all perfections. So, God, if he exists, would be the source of everything apart from himself. But then God couldn't, in principle, have a cause, since any such cause would have to have God as its source, in which case, it couldn't be God's causal source. That would be like me bringing my parents into existence, right? It just doesn't make any sense. Of course she's your grandmother, you perverted dope! Look! Come back to bed, dearie. Ah! It's impossible! I mean, if she's my grandmother, who's my grandfather? Isn't it obvious? You are! So defenders of the argument from chaos will probably respond that they have explanations as to why God isn't the kind of thing that could have a cause. By contrast, there doesn't seem to be any explanation for why the initial state of the universe would be relevantly different from everything else when it comes to the possibility of being caused. The opponent of the argument from chaos would then need to pinpoint some relevant difference between the initial state and non-initial states of the universe that could explain why the former, but not the latter, is the kind of thing that couldn't be caused. For instance, they could give some reason for thinking that causation is an essentially temporal relation. If that's right, then because the only thing that could in principle cause the initial state of temporal reality would have to be a timeless thing, thus violating the temporal nature of causation, the initial state of temporal reality couldn't, after all, have a cause. The opponent would therefore have an explanation for why the initial state of the universe, unlike non-initial states, couldn't have a cause. Remember that this is only one candidate reason the opponent of the argument from chaos might offer. There are other candidate reasons too, but for purposes of space, we won't explore them here. We do, however, invite you to explore them. Again, throughout this series, don't just take our word for things. Use the lights of reason and experience to test out what we say for yourself. That's how we become responsible, independent critical thinkers. Alrighty, let's recap. We began by articulating the argument from chaos from the causal principle. According to Craig's version of the argument, if the causal principle is false, it becomes inexplicable why whole swaths of random objects don't chaotically and uncausedly pop into existence all around us. And according to Proust and Rasmussen's version of the argument, we should accept the causal principle because it offers a simple, illuminating, and predictively successful explanation of why chaos doesn't pervade reality. We then examined three responses to the argument from chaos. According to the first response, there are other ways to rule out uncaused chaos that doesn't require any causal principle. According to the second response, the fully general causal principle isn't needed to rule out chaos, since restricted causal principles do the job just as well. These restricted causal principles, in turn, don't allow us to run the Kalam. Finally, according to the third response, the argument from chaos fails because it problematically overgeneralizes to timeless entities in addition to temporal entities. And that's a wrap. All right, so I hope you enjoyed those three videos. There's a lot of quite substantive philosophy in the videos, but as we repeatedly say throughout them, the goal is really to help you guys think critically about these topics. It's not to settle debates. It's not to try to bonk people over the head with arguments and try to convert them to our pre-existent views. It's to explore the matters and to get to the truth. Now, regarding this argument from chaos, I do have some addenda that I would like to cover. So something I wish we could add to the video is the following. Recall the laws of nature-based response to the argument from chaos. The basic idea was that we can appeal simply to laws of nature to explain why chaos doesn't pervade reality. 
no appeal need be made to the Kalam's causal principle. So the objection goes. Now, an objection we leveled toward this law-based response was that laws are arguably merely descriptive in import, and so they won't be able to do the explanatory heavy lifting with respect to preventing chaos. But we should have noted that this is a controversial claim about the laws of nature. There are indeed several metaphysical views of laws of nature, for example, Tim Maudlin's primitivism, among other views, on which laws are not merely descriptive in import, but instead play an explanatory role in accounting for the character of the spatiotemporal world. If one adopts one of these accounts of laws, one will avoid our objection here. So that's something that we should have noted. Another thing to keep in mind, which I'll return to later in this video, is that even if the laws don't have causal powers, not all explanatory work is done by causation. So we can ask, why isn't there chaos on the law-based response? Well, not because laws causally enforce order, and not because laws are productive. Instead, it's because everything in nature must, as a matter of necessity, satisfy or obey the laws. So just keep in mind the distinction between causal explanation and non-causal explanation. And finally, I want to address some concerns from one of my friends regarding the transfer and change principles and their ability to satisfactorily address the argument from chaos. So we're just going to go through these in turn. And my friend kind of just blasted these all at me, and I, I wanted to respond to them in case some of you guys had similar thoughts. So I'm just going to be systematically proceeding through each objection within the blast. So the first concern is that isn't the Kalam's causal principle, or KCP going forward, isn't that far simpler than the conjunction of the transfer and change principles, which going forward is going to be TCP? Well, my response is that it's actually not at all clear which is simpler, the KCP or the TCP. For starters, the KCP commits us to things that TCP doesn't, right? Since TCP doesn't entail that, for example, matter and energy beginning to exist, or the universe is beginning to exist, requires a cause. Whereas KCP, of course, commits us to that. And in that case, the KCP is less modest than TCP in several important respects. To be sure, TCP is less modest in other respects by placing constraints on the way that matter and energy can transfer into a system. But it's not at all clear which is more modest. The second concern is, doesn't KCP have greater explanatory scope than TCP? Like, we can ask, why is it true that from nothing, nothing comes? Well, the answer that the proponent of KCP offers is that the KCP is metaphysically necessary, so that explains why from nothing, nothing comes. TCP can't explain that, but KCP can, and so there's at least one advantage that KCP has over TCP. As I noted in response, however, that is just confused. The very question at issue is whether the principle from nothing, nothing comes is true, right? That's precisely what the argument from chaos is meant to establish. So we obviously can't treat it as a datum that the respective principles need to explain. Now, as it happens, from nothing, nothing comes is actually ambiguous. It could be saying, like, from a state of nothing, there cannot emerge something that comes from that state of nothingness. It's not as though something can, like, emerge from a state of non-being. Non-being can't produce something. Well, sure, when you put it that way, the principle seems obviously true. It seems pretty innocuous. But then it's just utterly irrelevant to the Kalam's causal principle. Because in denying the Kalam's causal principle, one is not saying that a state of nothingness can, like, burp out something. They're not saying that a state of nothingness can produce something. Instead, when they deny the causal principle, they're saying that at least some things can begin without being caused to begin by anything. So it's not as though they're coming from a state of non-being or emerging from a state of non-being or that they're being produced by non-being or nothingness. Rather, they're not being produced by anything. So denying the causal principle doesn't commit one to saying that there once was a state of nothingness, and then from that state of nothingness emerged something, or something like that. And nor does denying the causal principle imply that one must ascribe causal powers to nothingness. No. To deny the causal principle, you don't have to reify nothingness. You simply need to say that something can begin without being caused to begin by anything. You're not positively saying that something can be produced by non-being, or by a state of nothingness. Oh, actually, I anticipated myself, so I just wrote that next on the script. So, the ex nihilo nihil fit principle, which is this principle up here from nothing nothing comes, that means ex nihilo nihil fit. I probably pronounced that incorrectly, but that's okay. That principle is either irrelevant to KCP, or it's a mere restatement of it. So you can see this video here, which I'm going to take us through. When someone says that the universe began to exist without a cause, they're not saying, like, first there's non-being, and then there's some sort of like transition to being, yeah. and, like, being sort of, like, emerges from non-being or, like, is burped out of non-being. That's not what someone is saying when they're denying the causal principle. So it's, like, it's just irrelevant to the causal principle in that sense, if that's how we're uh, construing this this principle, ex nihilo nihil fit, uh, from nothing, nothing comes, um, or if being doesn't come from non-being. So it's either irrelevant to the causal principle, or if it is supposed to be relevant to it, then it's just a restatement of it. You're just saying that something can't begin to exist 
without there being like a prior thing that brings it into existence or some sort of causally prior thing that, that causes it. Uh, but in that case, it doesn't motivate the principle. That's just a restatement of the principle. <laughs> so it's either relevant or it's just a restatement. So either way, it doesn't support it. And so this would also address the quote unquote argument that I've seen some people offer for the Kalam's causal principle, according to which oh, nothing has no causal powers or potentialities. And so clearly something can't come from nothing because nothing doesn't even have the potential to produce something or it doesn't even have causal powers to produce something. But again, this is just committing that same mistake. It's reifying nothingness. It's committing the person who's denying the causal principle to saying that, oh, nothingness does have causal power or nothingness somehow possesses potentialities. But denying the causal principle does not require that. Denying the causal principle only requires saying that something can begin to exist without being caused by anything. You're not saying that there is such a thing as nothingness and it has the causal power or potentiality to bring about something. So that's not what someone is saying when they're denying the causal principle. So anyway, I wanted to address those arguments in addition to addressing this point here. KCP does not have greater explanatory scope just by dint of ex somehow explaining the principle that from nothing, nothing comes because that principle is either irrelevant to KCP or else it's just a restatement of it. In which case, we can't take it as data that the respective principles need to explain. All right, concern number three. If the defender of TCP wants to allow the possibility of something coming from nothing, they've reduced their position to sheer question-begging absurdity. Well, that is clearly wrong in response. Uh, the defender of TCP need take no stance on whether something can come from nothing. The point at issue is the following. We witness no chaos around us. We want to explain this. Craig says we need KCP to explain it. This is simply untrue. We can also explain it by appeal to TCP. The proponent of TCP needn't positively say that something can come from nothing, i.e. that something can begin to exist uncaused, since the TCP by itself implies neither that something can come from nothing, nor that something cannot come from nothing. TCP is just silent on that. And so the proponent of TCP, the person who's accepting that, needn't take any position on the matter. They need simply point out that Craig is clearly wrong to say that we need KCP to explain why we don't see chaos around us. We just don't, since TCP also explains that, and the truth of TCP does not require KCP. And of course, it's obviously not question-begging to commit neither to the truth nor falsity of the principle from nothing, nothing comes. All right, concern number four. Even with a restricted causal principle, or TCP, this would still fail to prevent chaos from happening. Only entities within a given system are subject to that system's principles. As a response, this fails to even understand TCP. TCP is a metaphysical principle placing metaphysically necessary constraints on how any matter and energy can enter any system. It's not a quote-unquote systems principle, i.e. a principle applying only to and within a given system. And that's just indisputable, right? It's literally how we defined TCP in the video that I just played. So if one denies that, you're simply failing to talk about TCP as we articulated it, right? Quoting the transfer principle, it says, matter and energy can only enter a system through the transfer of matter or energy from surrounding systems. Notice what TCP itself says by virtue of the transfer principle saying it. TCP says that it's impossible for matter or energy to enter a system without coming from surrounding systems. The principle literally entails that it's false that only entities within that system are subject to the principle. And so concern number four is just so obviously mistaken and it evinces a misunderstanding of TCP. All right, concern number five. External entities are not prevented from acting upon a system just because the system is limited by its own internal constraints. TCP does not prevent external entities from acting on a system. TCP doesn't say it's impossible for external entities to act upon a system. Instead, it simply says that when matter or energy enters a system, it must be causally transferred into the system from surrounding systems. This literally allows for external entities to act on the system by transferring matter or energy there too. All right, concern number six. Suggesting that TCP, or a restricted causal principle, is metaphysically necessary is convoluted and clearly puts the burden of proof on the one proffering said principles. A metaphysical principle with that level of specificity and seeming contingency just seems more like special pleading than live alternatives. Now, in response, concern number six simply asserts that it's convoluted. I don't at all see why it's problematically convoluted. I mean, to me, TCP is an easily statable, elegant, relatively simple principle that explains why we don't observe chaos. And also, if we're going to play the allegations of convolutedness game, I would venture that the KCP is itself monstrously convoluted, since begins to exist is notoriously difficult to articulate in a way that makes the principle non-trivial, substantive, and plausible. When you actually articulate the principle in full, it becomes a complex and convoluted articulation of various conditions under which something begins to exist, and then says that whenever those conditions are met, there must be a cause. So if TCP is guilty of being convoluted in some problematic manner, then I would urge that KCP is likewise.
Also, I don't think the burden of proof is shifted in the way described by concern number six. I mean, remember, Craig is the one offering the argument from chaos. He needs to show either that KCP is necessary to explain why we don't witness chaos, or that it's clearly the best way to explain this fact among the competing explanations. The former definitely won't work, since TCP also explains why we don't witness chaos. As for the second, neither Craig nor concern number six has given any good reason for thinking KCP is clearly the best way to explain this fact among the range of alternative explanations, this fact being the absence of chaos around us. All right, concern number seven. Sure, the TCP only permits the causal transfer of energy and matter from surrounding systems, and thus is compatible, in principle, with the universe itself beginning to exist uncaused. But this makes no sense. If an entire system of energy and matter can come about uncaused, why can't individual instances of matter and energy, for example, tigers, come about uncaused? In response, note first that the principle is simply consistent with the possibility of the universe beginning to exist uncaused. It's also consistent with the impossibility of the universe beginning to exist uncaused. Again, the principle takes no stand on that, and so the proponent of TCP needn't be committed to any allegedly absurd tension between 1. affirming the possibility that the universe itself begins uncaused, and yet 2. individual entrances of matter and energy into systems require causal transference from surrounding systems. Second, concern number seven is appealing to something like an intuition that if individual entrances of matter and energy into a system require causal transference from one or more surrounding systems, then the universe itself beginning would likewise require a cause. But the proponent of TCP may not share this intuition, and indeed many philosophers don't. If so, then concern number seven has no teeth against them. And of course, there are also many intuitions that tell against concern number seven's intuition. For instance, many people have strong intuitions against timeless to temporal causation, or against material objects being caused to begin without being made from any things or stuff. Those who share such intuitions will intuitively resist the conditional claim, which is the content of concern number seven's intuition. Since the individual entrances of matter and energy into systems from surrounding systems don't involve timeless to temporal causation or material beginnings without material causes, and yet the universe's beginning arguably would. And so then those who share such intuitions have a principled way to resist the intuition mentioned up here. All right, concern number eight. Even if one grants TCP, this just pushes the problem back further. Individual tigers cannot enter a system uncaused? Fine. But let's suppose a tiger system or universe comes into existence uncaused for just enough time to transfer an individual tiger and make it quote-unquote pop, that is, transfer into our world. You may have avoided chaos at the first level, but it's still ultimately chaotic, because the tiger system that brought the tiger into our world came about uncaused. And there's nothing preventing arbitrarily many other systems coming into existence uncaused, so long as we don't adopt the KCP, thereby leading to a chaos of individual objects or property changes being transferred to our world. So the basic idea here is that TCP fails, after all, to prevent chaos. Now, in response, this concern faces a dilemma. These new systems that come into existence either come into existence within the universe or outside the universe. If they come into existence within the universe, then TCP is violated, since the universe will then be a system within which there is an entrance of energy that wasn't causally transferred from a surrounding system. Instead, these systems and their containing matter or energy just entered the system without any cause at all. This is not possible per TCP. So TCP does indeed prevent these systems from coming into existence within the universe. By contrast, if they come into existence outside the universe, then TCP is once again violated, since the universe will then be a system within which there is an entrance of energy that wasn't causally transferred from a surrounding system. A surrounding system is a system that is spatiotemporally related to the system under consideration. But anything outside the universe is by definition not spatiotemporally related to the universe. Right? Instead, anything outside the universe must either be non-spatiotemporal or else exist in an island universe, spatiotemporally isolated from the universe, or our universe, that is. Right? A universe, after all, is just a maximally spatiotemporally connected collection of things. Right? That's just how we're understanding universe, following the literature more broadly. So anything outside a universe is not spatiotemporally related to said universe. So, again, TCP is once more violated. So, while TCP doesn't prevent island universes from coming into existence uncaused, it does prevent matter from entering our universe from those universes. So, whichever horn you choose, TCP is violated. And so, TCP does indeed prevent the higher-order chaos to which concern number eight adverts. And hence, objection number eight fails. In short, TCP does, after all, prevent the chaos that the concern alleged that it doesn't. All right, concern number nine. 
TCP is highly specific, only pertaining to matter-energy transference, to the point of being ad hoc, whereas the Coulomb's causal principle is quite general and applies to everything, and hence it's simpler. Now, in response, firstly, I don't think speaking of matter-energy transference is highly specified or highly specific, right? Highly specified looks like this. Anything that begins to exist in Joe's room from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Wednesdays in 2023 has a cause. Right. That is worryingly specific. But a general principle applying to any matter energy transference is nowhere near as specific. And by my lights, it isn't any more specific than the Kalam's causal principle with its rather highfalutin and highly specified notion of begins to exist that we covered earlier in the video. Given, again, how one needs to theoretically characterize begins to exist to render the KCP non-trivial substantive and facially plausible. At the very least, concern number nine has done nothing to show why TCP is worryingly more specific than KCP, and yet it would need to do so in order to make any headway in defending the argument from chaos from the TCP-based criticism. So that's the first response to concern number nine. The second response is that even if TCP is more specific, there are respects in which it's far more modest than KCP, which I already covered earlier. And it's not at all clear whether the specificity cost counterbalances or outweighs the modesty benefits that it accrues. Concern number nine would need to establish that it does, and yet concern number nine does no such thing. All right, so having addressed all nine of these concerns that my friend blasted to me, we can now move on to the modus hons argument. So this is a, another argument in favor of the causal principle, the Kalam's causal principle, or KCP. Now, before considering the argument itself, we should at least get clear on what modus tollens is. In short, modus tollens is a logically valid argument form with the following structure. One, if P is true, then Q is true. Two, but Q is not true. So, three, P is not true, right? You're basically saying if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. This form is logically valid in that the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. In other words, it cannot be the case that the premises are true while the conclusion is false. And with that preliminary covered, we can now examine Locke's modus tollens argument, or what I'll hereafter call the MTA for modus tollens argument. Locke defends the MTA in Chapter 5 of his 2017 book, God and Ultimate Origins, as well as his recent 2022 book on the Kalam and teleological arguments. In its clearest and simplest articulation, the MTA runs as follows. So it's in the form of modus tollens. I'll give you the broad argument before I get into this stuff in blue. So the overarching argument is one, if our universe begins to exist uncaused, other things would also begin to exist uncaused. Two, it is not the case that those other things begin to exist uncaused. And so three, it is not the case that our universe began to exist uncaused. That's the overarching argument. And of course, premise two is true. So really, the point of contention with respect to proponents and opponents of the causal principle is going to be premise one. If our universe begins to exist uncaused, other things would also begin to exist uncaused. Why should we accept that? Well, here's the basic thrust of the reasoning that Locke offers on its behalf. Firstly, there will be no cause that makes it the case that only the universe, rather than other things, begin to exist uncaused. Secondly, whatever properties that differentiate the universe and other things will be had by these things only when they had already begun. And thirdly, the circumstances are compatible with other things beginning to exist. So given A, B, and C, this implies there will be no difference between our universe and other things and other events where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. So if there is no relevant difference, then other things would also begin to exist uncaused. Right? The basic idea is that there's going to be no cause which can make it the case that only the universe rather than other things begin to exist uncaused, right? because we're supposing that the universe begins to exist uncaused. So there's going to be no cause that makes it the case that only the universe rather than those other things begin to exist uncaused. And moreover, so Locke argues, you can't pinpoint some unique property that differentiates the two and in virtue of which only the universe begins to exist uncaused rather than other things beginning to exist uncaused because whatever properties that differentiate the universe and those other things will be had by those things only when they had already begun. So as it were, it comes too late in the explanatory chain. And thirdly, the circumstances are compatible with other things beginning to exist. So for instance, the circumstances of this room are compatible with, say, certain properties beginning to exist, like the temperature just suddenly ramping up or certain electromagnetic fields in here taking on a different strength, or what have you. Given A through C, says Logue, that implies that there's no relevant difference between our universe and other things with respect to beginning to exist uncaused. And so if the universe begins to exist uncaused, other things would also do so.
Now, Lowe claims that there would need to be some special property S that the actual initial state has, the actual initial state of the universe. Again, we're assuming that the universe began to exist, okay? Let, let's assume that as a background condition for this discussion. I don't think that's been established. I don't think it's been adequately justified. You can check out my Kalam playlist for more on that. But let's just assume that it's a background condition such that there is an initial state of the universe. But anyway, Lowe claims that there would need to be some special property S that the actual initial state has that other logically possible states don't have that grounds why the actual initial state began to exist uncaused, while other logically possible states don't begin to exist uncaused. Now, the problem with such a property as S, of course, is that in order for the initial state to have S, right, it would already have to exist, and hence already have to have begun to exist, right? If we let C stand for the actual initial state that purportedly began to exist uncaused, and B stand for a logically possible alternative initial state, Locke writes that if it's required that C is already existing in order that the possession of S by C can account for the uncaused beginning of C instead of B, then the possession of S by C is not what accounts for the uncaused beginning of C instead of B in the first place. Right. In short, property S cannot account for why the actual initial state occurred uncaused, rather than other logically possible alternative initial states beginning uncaused. And it also cannot serve to differentiate the actual initial state from non-initial states where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. And this is because S comes too late in the explanatory order to account for the initial state's privileged status as beginning uncaused, as opposed to alternative logically possible initial and non-initial states beginning uncaused. Now, there are really two distinct worries here. First, what is the special property in virtue of which the actual initial state begins uncaused, rather than other logically possible initial states beginning uncaused? By definition, Locke argues, we cannot appeal to some prior causal condition which delimits the range of possibilities here, which of course is Locke's preferred solution to this problem. But nor can we appeal to any property of the actual initial state, since any such property would be posterior to the obtaining of the initial state, and hence cannot be that in virtue of which it obtains uncaused, rather than other logically possible initial states. Secondly, what is the special property in virtue of which the actual initial state begins uncaused, whereas non-initial things don't or can't begin uncaused? Again, we cannot appeal to any special property of the initial state that grounds this, since any such property is posterior to its already existing, and its already having begun to exist, in which case any such property cannot do the explanatory heavy lifting when it comes to explaining the difference between it, that is the actual initial state, and non-initial things on the other hand, where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. And so the basic idea is that if we can't appeal to any prior causal conditions, which serves as the relevant difference between the actual initial state and non-initial states where beginning to exist and cause is concerned, and if we can't appeal to any special property to account for that, then it seems as though there's going to be no relevant difference between the actual initial state and non-initial states where beginning to exist and cause is concerned. And if there's no relevant difference between them, well then if the former begins to exist and cause, then the latter would too. So the thought goes. That's just a kind of rough and ready sketch of the argument. Again, if you want to see the reasoning worked out more fully, just go up here or the resources that I mentioned. So I'll now explore three responses that one might level towards the MTA, and let's get on to those in turn. So the first response to the MTA is the symmetry problem. The idea is that the exact same underlying problem that the MTA pinpoints, assuming of course that it is a problem, afflicts any view on which there is an uncaused item. Right, recall that Locke's central worry is that a special property of the initial state, in virtue of which it and it alone begins uncaused, is required if one wants to assert that only the initial state begins uncaused. And yet, that the existence of such a property presupposes that its bearer already exists, in which case the special property comes too late in the explanatory order so as to account for why the initial state alone can begin uncaused. But importantly, the exact same reasoning applies to any view which posits something uncaused. Right? The same reasoning applies, for instance, to God. We can ask, why does God timelessly exist uncaused, rather than the whole infinity of logically possible things that could timelessly exist uncaused? And why does God exist uncaused, whereas other non-initial things don't or can't exist uncaused? Of course, we can't appeal to any causal preconditions here, right, because God is uncaused, and that's shared with Locke's reasoning, remember, he says you can't appeal to a prior causal condition, so then there need to be some special property that differentiates them, and in virtue of which, the initial state and it alone begins uncaused, whereas other things don't. 
But likewise, crucially, there could be no special property in virtue of which such a timeless being exists uncaused rather than some other logically coherent timeless beings. And nor could there be such a special property that differentiates such a timeless being from temporal beings where existing uncaused is concerned. By the very same reasoning as before, any such special property would be posterior to the existence of the timeless thing, bearing said property, and hence it couldn't do the relevant explanatory work. Any such property would depend on there already, as it were, being such a timeless thing, and so it can't account for why that timeless thing and that thing alone exists uncaused, whereas other things do require a cause. You won't be able to appeal to a special property to explain this and nor can you appeal to a prior cause. Now, perhaps you think beginninglessness could do the explanatory work here. Locke, for instance, seems to say this when he writes that the requirement for explaining why something begins to exist uncaused is different from the requirement for explaining why something is uncaused. In the case of God, beginningless is a property that can do the explanatory job for why God exists uncaused. Now, on its face, this is implausible by my lights. Mere beginninglessness is surely insufficient for being uncaused. I mean, after all, lots of theists think that God eternally and timelessly causes abstract objects to exist. Such abstract objects, were they to exist, would be beginningless, and yet caused to exist. And given that there doesn't seem to be anything in principle incoherent about such views, beginninglessness wouldn't be able to demarcate the uncaused from the caused. To put it differently, beginninglessness doesn't appear sufficient for being uncaused. In principle, it's at least an eminent epistemic possibility that something could be beginningless and yet be caused. And so merely being beginningless doesn't appear sufficient to explain something's being uncaused. But set that aside, since it isn't really the main issue. The main issue with Locke's answer is as follows. Given his reasoning against any property's ability to ground why the initial state alone can begin uncaused, it simply follows that beginninglessness cannot, in principle, be that in virtue of which God and God alone can exist uncaused. This is because any property of God's you might cite to explain why God and God alone can exist uncaused depends on God already existing. Right? In other words, properties depend on the prior reality of their bearers, regardless of whether their bearers begin to exist or exist beginninglessly. Right? This is just a general fact about properties and their dependence on the substances that have them. As Locke himself puts it in his 2022 book, a thing has to exist in order to have any properties at all. To draw out this point, consider God's love. Right? God's love cannot ground or explain God's existence, or God's existing in a particular way, like existing uncaused. The reason for this should be clear, right? There is no such thing as God's love unless God exists in the first place to be loving, right? I mean, existing is the most fundamental fact about something, really. It's partly because something exists that can have any other properties at all. And so, God's love cannot be that in virtue of which God exists in the first place. God's existence is, in other words, prior to God's various other properties. Explanatorily prior, that is. We're now then in a position to see why beginninglessness cannot explain why God and God alone can exist uncaused, given Locke's reasoning in the case of uncaused beginnings. Just as property S cannot ground why the initial state alone begins uncaused, since the initial state would already have to exist in order to have S, or perhaps already would have had to begun to exist in order to have S, God's beginninglessness likewise cannot ground why God alone exists uncaused, since God would already have to exist in order to have the property of being beginningless. So, if Locke's reasoning counts against an uncaused beginning view, it equally counts against his own theistic view. In fact, notice that we can run an entirely symmetrical argument against the theistic view. Right? I've kind of put these two arguments right next to each other, but they're almost word for word identical. But the evident symmetry between them should, if we accept this argument, lead us to accept this argument. So let's go through this argument. Right? If God beginninglessly exists uncaused, other beginningless things would also exist uncaused. Why is that? Well, because, firstly, there will be no cause that makes it the case that only God rather than other beginningless things exist uncaused. Secondly, whatever properties that differentiate God and other beginningless things will be had by these things only when they already exist. Right? And note that already here expresses priority in the order of explanation or grounding, not temporal priority. Thirdly, the circumstances are compatible with other beginningless things existing. So, given A, B, and C, this implies there will be no difference between God and other beginningless things, where existing beginninglessly uncaused is concerned. So, if there's no relevant difference in this respect, what that means is that other beginningless things would likewise exist uncaused. But it's not the case that those other beginningless things exist uncaused, and so it is not the case that God beginninglessly exists uncaused. But of course, if theism is true, then God does beginninglessly exist uncaused, so theism is false. 
Indeed, we don't even need to run the argument in terms of other things existing beginninglessly uncaused. We can also run the symmetry argument or the parity argument by just talking about existing uncaused. Premise 1, if God exists uncaused, then non-God things would also exist uncaused. 2, it is not the case that those other things exist uncaused. 3, so it is not the case that God exists uncaused. Now, why should we accept this first premise? Well, the reasoning is entirely parallel to the above sort of reasoning in the MTA. First, there will be no cause that makes it the case that only God rather than other things exist uncaused, right? This just definitionally follows from the fact that God exists uncaused, which we are hypothetically supposing. Secondly, whatever properties that differentiate God and other things will be had by these things only when they already exist. So you also can't appeal to any special properties that only God has and other things don't have, which can account for why only God and not them exist uncaused, because any such properties that you appeal to are explanatorily posterior to God's already obtaining, and hence already obtaining uncaused. So you can neither appeal to a cause, nor can you appeal to special properties to account for the relevant difference between God and other things, where existing uncaused is concerned. And thirdly, the circumstances are indeed compatible with other things existing, right? Just as the circumstances are compatible with other things beginning to exist, like the circumstances in my room are compatible with the room temperature suddenly increasing, so too the circumstances in my room are compatible with other things existing. It's entirely compatible with the circumstances of my room that say new properties exist in here, or that there's a chair in the corner where there's no chair, etc. So given A, B, and C, this implies that there will be no difference between God and other things where existing uncaused is concerned. And if there's no relevant difference, what this means is that other things would also exist uncaused. Now, note that while Loke's original argument is restricted to beginnings, this isn't relevant to my criticism here. Right? My criticism is that the reasoning Loke employs would, if successful, equally apply to God and other beginningless things. So even if Loke wishes to restrict his argument to beginnings, the justification for one of his crucial steps in the argument would equally justify this symmetrical argument against beginningless uncaused things. Right, the fundamental point is that the properties that differentiate God and other logically possible beginningless things can only be had by them if they already exist. And hence, no special property can be that in virtue of which God, rather than such other beings, beginninglessly exist uncaused. We can actually put this criticism of the MTA in the form of a dilemma. Either properties are explanatorily posterior to the existence of the bearers or not. If properties are explanatorily posterior to the existence of their bearers, then the property of being beginningless cannot be that in virtue of which God and God alone beginninglessly exists uncaused, for then such a property would be explanatorily prior to God's existence, contradicting our assumption that it was instead explanatorily posterior. And in that case, the MTA implies that theism is false. By dint of implying the symmetrical argument, which itself implies that theism is false. So there isn't a direct entailment of there, of course, but there's an indirect one. But if properties are not explanatorily posterior to the existence of their bearers, then we can't rule out that some property of the initial state explains why it and it alone begins uncaused. For then, such a property need not be explanatorily posterior to the initial states having begun to exist. And so, in principle, the door is open to some such property being explanatorily prior to the initial state's beginning, so as to explain why it and it alone begins uncaused. Finally, note that it's no use responding that my criticism here commits a two-quote quay fallacy, right? When we are comparing the relative merits of different theories about ultimate reality, if an alleged problem for one theory turns out to afflict literally every other theory on offer, or at least the relevant alternative theories being assessed, then the fact that one theory suffers from the problem gives no advantage whatsoever to any other theory. Right? That's because those theories too suffer from the alleged problem. And so, if the problem afflicts each theory on offer, it gives us no reason whatsoever to prefer any particular theory. Now, Locke considers something like this response in his 2022 book, and so in the document available for patrons, I systematically go through what he writes therein, and I respond thereto on behalf of the problem above. But for purposes of space, it would take us way too long to go through everything here, and so we're just going to skip to the second problem. Again, patrons have access to that additional bonus information, but let's just go on to the second problem for the MTA. So a second response to the MTA is to challenge Locke's claim that if just the initial state begins to exist uncaused, there would need to be some special property that the actual initial state has that grounds why it and it alone begins uncaused. Instead of appealing to special properties, it seems plausible that we only need to appeal to metaphysical principles. Someone like Graham Oppie has two metaphysical principles that, together with his naturalism and branching actualist theory of modality, allows him to explain why non-initial things don't begin to exist uncaused, 
and why the actual initial state alone begins uncaused. Here's Oppie's branching actualism, by the way. The view is that possible worlds are alternative ways that the actual world could have gone, or could go, or could one day go. Possible worlds all share an initial history with the actual world, and branch from the actual world only as a result of the outworkings of objective chance. Now, Oppie's two principles here are that one, everything has an explanation, and two, all non-initial things have causes. Oppie's branching actualism, together with his naturalism, entails that the only possible initial state of causal reality is the actual initial state of causal reality. All of these together imply that nothing other than the actual initial state can begin uncaused. Note also that it isn't question-begging for Oppie to appeal to his naturalistic commitments here. Arguments are powerless for you if it simply falls out of your commitments that one or more of their premises are false. And so it's perfectly kosher for Oppie to point out that an argument, in virtue of containing one or more premises to which he isn't committed, gives him no reason to abandon his commitments. Another metaphysical principle the detractor could appeal to in order to explain why only the initial state begins uncaused rather than non-initial things beginning uncaused as well is the principle that causation is essentially temporal in character. That is, causes must be before or simultaneous with their effects, and hence there cannot be timeless to temporal causation. If this is correct, then we can explain why the beginning of time itself cannot have a cause, since the only thing outside of time that could cause time's beginning is something timeless. And yet, per the aforementioned principle, timeless things cannot cause temporal things. Hence, we have an explanation for why the initial state of temporal reality cannot have a cause. Moreover, this explanation uniquely demarcates the initial state of temporal reality from non-initial things, events, and states, since the latter can have causes that are before or simultaneous with them. If we add the metaphysical principle that all beginnings within time require causes, or the principle that everything that can have a cause does have a cause, then we have an explanation for why only the initial state begins uncaused without appealing to some special property had by the initial state. Instead, we appealed to metaphysical principles. You might, of course, wonder why we should believe that causation is essentially temporal in character. That's a good question. But note that the burden of proof here isn't on the detractor of the MTA to show that causation is essentially temporal. Rather, the burden is on the proponent of the MTA to show that causation isn't essentially temporal. The reason is that if they fail to rule out causation's essentially temporal character, then they fail to rule out the explanation involving the aforementioned metaphysical principles. And hence they fail to show why a special property of the initial state is needed to do the explanatory heavy lifting, as opposed to employing one of those metaphysical principles. Also, I actually covered several reasons favoring the essentially temporal character of causation earlier in this video. The reasons were based on induction, inference to the best explanation, rational intuition, etc. Finally, note that the premise or claim that my second response targets is condition D. Right? Condition D says, given A, B, and C, this implies that there will be no difference between our universe and other things and other events where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. So if there's no relevant difference, then other things would also begin to exist uncaused if the universe began to exist uncaused. It is simply false that all of A, B, and C jointly imply that there's no difference between the universe, or more precisely, the actual initial state of the universe, on the one hand, and other things and events, on the other hand, where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. Even if all of A, B, and C are true, there could still be such a difference, namely a difference implied by the aforementioned metaphysical principles. So D isn't true. It doesn't follow from A, B, and C that there's therefore no relevant difference between the universe and other non-initial things and events where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. The relevant difference can be afforded by how the metaphysical principles cited earlier imply different things about initial and non-initial things. Once more, Locke in his 2022 book responds to an objection that's similar to this objection, and I systematically engage his responses in tremendous depth in this document. Anyway, patrons are going to have access to this exclusive content, but for the purposes of time, let's get on to the third objection to the MTA, and that third objection is that condition C is false. All right, y'all, quick change of plan. I wrote up this third objection way back when I had a certain conversation in 2020 with Graham Oppie and Alex Malpass. Since then, I've forgotten some key points which I would need to remember in order to presently assess whether this third objection succeeds. Specifically, in the paragraph below, beginning with under the second understanding, I make reference to quote-unquote Oppie's answer, presuming, of course, that the question Oppie is answering is clear to the reader. 
Now, at the time, it must have been clear to me, quite obviously, uh, but having not thought about this third criticism since 2020, I totally forgot what question I was referring to. And since I can't presently assess whether this third objection succeeds, and since further, you can't assess it either, given that I didn't specify what question I'm referring to, I think it would be intellectually irresponsible to present the criticism in this video. So, while you patrons can read the paragraphs in this third criticism if you want, just bear in mind that I currently don't have a sufficient grasp of the criticism in order to assess whether it succeeds, and I doubt that you guys would too. Uh, but anyway, in case you're curious, you can look at it. You, as in the patrons who have access to this document. Play a drinking game where every time I say that, you take a shot. All right, so let's get into a summary of the overarching dialectic of the MTA. So I began this particular portion of the video by articulating the modus solens argument, or the MTA, which reasons as follows. If our universe began to exist uncaused, then other things would also begin to exist uncaused. But since other things do not begin to exist uncaused, it follows that the universe didn't begin to exist uncaused. I then explored responses to the MTA. The first response is that the exact same problem that the MTA pinpoints, assuming of course that it is a problem, afflicts any view on which there is an uncaused item and hence the MTA would equally refute theism. I developed a symmetry argument to make this particularly vivid. The second response challenges Locke's claim that if just the initial state begins to exist uncaused, there would need to be some special property that the actual initial state has that grounds why it and it alone begins uncaused. Instead of appealing to special properties, we need only appeal to metaphysical principles. I then articulated Oppie's two metaphysical principles, as well as two other metaphysical principles, and explained why they offer explanations for why just the initial state begins to exist uncaused. And finally, here are some resources on the MTA for those who want to dig in deeper. Alright, so onwards we march to arguments against the causal principle. So in this portion of the video, I'll be covering the following arguments against the causal principle. From intuition, from free will, from conceivability, from quantum mechanics, from non-causal explanations, and Adolf Grunbaum's argument. Again, I can't hope to cover every possible argument against the causal principle, but these are definitely the most prominent ones. So, the first argument, the first one up, is intuition, and we got the Uno reverse card here. So just as people report having intuitions in favor of the causal principle, a number of people report having intuitions against it. This is different from just not having an intuition in favor of the causal principle. Instead, it involves having an intuition against the causal principle. In particular, a number of people report that it seems obvious to them that it's at least possible for something to begin uncaused. They don't see anything absurd or contradictory or impossible about it, and it seems to them perfectly benign. If intuitions defeasibly justify, and you can see my video on intuition for more on that, then the denial of the causal principle is justified, at least for those sharing the intuitions against the causal principle. So I ask, what are we to make of this line of reasoning against the causal principle? Well, a lot of responses to the argument from intuition in favor of the causal principle that I examined earlier on in this video will equally apply to this argument, and I'm not going to retrace those steps here. For now, I just want to make a few notes. First, clearly not everyone shares this intuition against the causal principle, and arguably intuitions only provide defeasible justification for those who have the intuitions. So the dialectical appeal of the current argument is going to be quite limited. Moreover, the fact of divergent intuitions potentially threatens the justificatory power of those intuitions. In other words, the fact that there are divergent intuitions on the matter might undercut or might undermine the support that one's intuitions would otherwise provide to one for thinking that the contents of those intuitions are true. Now, exploring all this would take me too far afield for present purposes. Uh, for more, you can see my video on intuition linked above. Secondly, it's unclear whether such individuals are really intuiting the possibility of uncaused beginnings, as opposed to simply not intuiting the impossibility of uncaused beginnings. Right? There is a distinction there, right? There's a distinction between the possibility of something really striking one as obvious versus it's simply not striking one as obvious that something is impossible. Right, so there's a difference between intuiting the possibility of something and simply not intuiting its impossibility. And only the former of these would provide someone with intuition-based justification for the content of their intuition. And again, it's just not clear whether such individuals are really intuiting the possibility of uncaused beginnings as opposed to simply not intuiting the impossibility. Right, they might just like not see anything wrong with uncaused beginnings. But that's different from positively seeing that there is nothing wrong with it, that it really could have been the case. But alas, perhaps they have very good introspective access to their phenomenological states, and in particular their intuitions, and maybe they really can intuit the possibility of uncaused beginnings, and they're not merely just failing to intuit the impossibility of uncaused beginnings. At the very least, this distinction is another tool that you can put in your philosophical toolkit and keep in mind for evaluating arguments. 
After all, this is also relevant to the modal ontological argument. Oftentimes when people come across the premise that, hey, it's at least possible that God exists, some people think that that's intuitive, but arguably they're just simply not intuiting God's impossibility, right? They, they don't have the positive intuition that God is absurd or obviously impossible, but not intuiting the impossibility of God or not intuiting the absurdity of God or not seeing anything contradictory or absurd about God existing is crucially different from positively seeing that God could exist. So this distinction here is definitely relevant to broader philosophical debates. Okay, anyway, on to the next argument from free will. So the second argument against the causal principle that we'll examine is the argument from free will. So according to many theists, both God and humans enjoy free will, that is, the ability to control our actions in a way that allows us to be responsible for them. Plausibly, one requirement on someone having free will is that they are the ultimate sources or originators of their actions, right? Otherwise, people would just be pushed and pulled by factors outside their control. But if the causal principle is true, it would seem that we cannot be the ultimate sources of our actions, and hence none of us would enjoy free will. For if the causal principle is true, all of our decisions, because they begin to exist, require causes. If we, as agents, are causes of our decisions, the very agent causing of decisions itself begins to exist, and hence would itself require a further cause. And of course it would be no use to appeal to further agent causings or further decisions as a cause, since those too would begin to exist, and so those too would require a cause. Lest we proceed to infinity, it seems unavoidable that our decisions and actions ultimately derive from causes that aren't decisions or agent causings of our own, in which case we are not the ultimate sources or originators of our decisions and actions, and that, as explained above, would seem to rule out free will. Philosopher Michael Almeida in his book Cosmological Arguments puts this general line of reasoning quite clearly. There is also reason to believe that premise one, that is the Kalam's causal principle, is false from the possibility of libertarian freedom. Many theists endorse a form of source libertarianism, according to which an agent is free only if the agent is the source of, the cause of, her actions. Consider the event of S freely choosing to do A. The cause of A is S, and there is nothing that causes S to cause A. S's causing A is an event that comes into existence uncaused. So, according to source libertarianism, it is perfectly possible that some things come into existence uncaused. But then it's not necessary that everything that begins to exist has a cause. And so, concludes Almeida, premise one is false. What's more, if everything that begins to exist has a cause, it would seem that causal determinism is true. In other words, it would seem that all events are necessary or inevitable consequences of prior factors that causally produce them. But that straightforwardly rules out a particular theory of free will that many theists accept, including Craig and most prominent defenders of the Kalam. That theory, of course, is libertarianism, according to which one, causal determinism is incompatible with free will, two, we do have free will, and hence three, causal determinism is false. Libertarianism thus implies that causal determinism is false, but if the causal principle implies causal determinism, then defenders of the Kalam will have to give up libertarianism. Thus, there are at least two distinct challenges to the causal principle from free will. First, the causal principle seems incompatible with free will because it seems to imply that we are not the ultimate sources or originators of our actions. Second, the causal principle seems incompatible with specifically libertarian free will because it seems to imply causal determinism. Having articulated these two challenges, let's consider five responses thereto. So the first response is about indeterministic causation. So in response to the second challenge to libertarianism, note that the causal principle doesn't actually entail causal determinism. For the principle doesn't say that whatever begins to exist has a deterministic cause, that is, a cause that necessitates or renders inevitable its effect. The Kalam's causal principle is perfectly compatible with things having indeterministic causes, that is, causes that don't necessitate or render inevitable their effects. With indeterministic causation, the exact same initial causal conditions could have given rise to a different effect, or perhaps no effect at all. This, in turn, allows for alternative possibilities in action that libertarians see as crucial for free will. Overall, then, the causal principle doesn't imply causal determinism, and so it doesn't threaten libertarian free will, at least on this front. Okay, so that second, that second challenge up there was bogus. <laughs> Hopefully someone didn't write an angry comment as I was uh, articulating it and uh, at least purporting to defend it. I don't defend this. I think this is a terrible argument here. The causal principle doesn't apply causal determinism. But the first argument is actually a lot trickier to respond to, so let's get to some responses to that. So the second general response to these challenges is to restrict the causal principle. So yeah, another response to both challenges is to restrict the causal principle to objects, and to argue that this avoids any tensions with free will and libertarianism. 
So instead of quantifying over everything that begins to exist, the principle would quantify only over objects that begin to exist. This would allow, in principle, actions, decisions, agent causings, events, and the like, to fall outside the scope of the principle, and so the principle would pose no threat to free will or libertarianism. Right? If you restrict the principle to objects, then it's not going to be implying that any event whatsoever, like actions, decisions, agent causings, and, and so on, require causes. And so you will completely remove, so the thought goes, the above-mentioned threats to free will. There are, however, several problems with this response. First, as I explained in the sections on intuition and induction, restricted principles tend to be more complex, less explanatory, and suffer from probabilistic tension. For instance, the very fact that all beginnings of one kind require causes gives us reason to expect that beginnings of other kinds likewise require causes. And hence a hypothesis that says that the former require causes while the latter don't has components that are in tension with one another. Right? One of the components gives us reason to think that the other component is false. This in turn makes the hypothesis overall less likely to be true. And this can actually be proved with some quick maths, uh, but I don't want to bore you. You can see the freeze frame in the intuition section of this video. Second, almost all arguments leveled in favor of premise one, in favor of the Kalam's causal principle, would equally apply to events and actions, not just objects. So for instance, Craig says that if things could come into existence uncaused, then it becomes inexplicable why things like bicycles and Beethoven and root beer don't come into existence uncaused. But we could equally say that if some events or actions could come into existence uncaused, then it becomes inexplicable why any and every event or action doesn't come into existence uncaused. For instance, it becomes inexplicable why the random flailing of my arms, or the amputation of my arms, or the popping of my eyeballs out of their sockets don't spontaneously and causelessly happen. It becomes inexplicable, too, why my chair just doesn't randomly and uncausedly start moving across the room, and why the floor doesn't just randomly and uncausedly catch fire. In short, chaos would rear its ugly head. And most, if not all, the other arguments for the causal principle would equally apply to events and actions, in which case one can't consistently mount such arguments while allowing for uncaused events or actions. So basically, if defenders of the Kalam are going to be accepting the Kalam's causal principle as restricted to objects on the basis of the various arguments that we considered, well then for precisely the same reasons they need to be accepting the more general causal principle. For these two reasons, I don't think the second response to the argument from free will is a good one. The third response to the argument from free will hinges on clarifications to the notion of free will. So yeah, a third response, this one targeting the first of the two challenges, the one about ultimate sourcehood, is that clarifications on free will render the challenge moot. Recall that first challenge, right? An agent S causes an action or decision A. But the problem is that S's causing of A itself begins to exist, and so itself needs a cause. But if this needs a cause, then there's something outside the agent's control that causes the agent to act or decide, in which case the agent isn't ultimately responsible for their action or decision, since they aren't its ultimate source or originator. But several points can be made here that seem to remove this objection's force, or at least seem on their face to remove the objection's force. First, the proponent of free will can simply hold that there is no such thing as the event of S's causing A, and hence there isn't anything here, in addition to S, the states internal to S and A, needing to be caused. So there is simply no such thing as S's causing A. Sure, S and S's internal states, like reasons, beliefs, and desires all exist, and sure, A exists, right, the action that S performs, that exists. But there isn't some further thing. S is causing A, over and above S, S's internal states, and A. And so it's simply false that S is causing A begins to exist, since there's no such thing as S is causing A. Right? It doesn't exist at all, and so, of course, it didn't begin to exist, because th there's no such thing as that. And in that case, the need for a cause of S is causing A is blocked, and with it, the objection from free will. Now, Admittedly, one might find this response really unintuitive, as Eric Wielenberg notes in my discussion with him on the Kalam, that's in my Kalam playlist. That is, one might just find it deeply intuitively plausible that agent causings are events or happenings, right? After all, if they aren't events, what are? Like, what's the relevant difference between them and other events that could account for why they, that is, agent causings, aren't events, while the other actual events are events? Like, what could account for that? The general thought is that if anything is an event, agent causings are events. They're happenings. They're things that occur. Anyway, so the thought goes. That's how someone might push back on this first response to the argument from free will. Here's a second response. Suppose there is some event corresponding to S's causing A. Even still, this doesn't threaten free will. 
since the cause of this event's beginning to exist could simply be S itself, right? So we have S causes A, right? S causes the action. S also causes S is causing A. And in turn, S also causes S is causing S is causing A. And so on ad infinitum, right? Here we have S and then the causal relation in A. And then we have the event of S is causing A. And so we can ask what causes the event of S is causing A? Well, the answer is S itself, right? S is the cause of the event of S is causing A. And what about the event of S is causing the event of S is causing A? Well, that too has a cause, and it's S, and so on ad infinitum. And one might think that this isn't, like, super absurd or implausible either. Like, fundamentally, we just have S, an agent, who agent causes a decision or action A. But in causing A, S thereby brings about S's very causing of A. And S thereby also brings about S is causing of S is causing of A, and so on down the list. Note that S isn't here performing infinitely many actions or making infinitely many decisions, right? Instead, fundamentally, S just makes one decision or performs one act, and it is simply a logical consequence of this performance that S thereby brings about the ever-ascending chain of higher-order events. Now, Note that this option won't be available to some of the most prominent arguments within the philosophical case for the Kalam's second premise, that the universe began to exist, right? Since the option at hand entails an actual infinity of ever-ascending events. But it is at least open to people who seek to defend the Kalam's second premise without relying on philosophical arguments against actual infinities. Still, though, in response to the second point, like, there is something deeply implausible about the postulation of an actual infinity of ever-ascending events for literally every free choice that anyone makes, like, <laughs> that seems to be a, a pretty big cost to this view. That's not only deeply intuitively implausible, but it's also like metaphysical profligacy in excelsis. It's a very unsimple view, the postulation of literally, actually infinitely many ever-ascending events <laughs> for literally every choice that anyone ever makes. All right, so what about a third response? Well, the, as a third point, proponents of free will can hold that S's causing A is caused by S's reasons, desires, and general psychological makeup at the time of acting. And note that for libertarians, of course, this cause will be indeterministic. The proponent of free will can argue, in turn, that this view doesn't problematically entail that S isn't the origin or source of S's actions and decisions. They can maintain that so long as S occupies an appropriate place in the causal nexus leading up to S's acts and decisions, S is enough of an originator or source of S's actions and decisions to allow for control and responsibility. Nevertheless, you might still have lingering worries about S him or herself not being the ultimate source of his or her actions on this picture, but we're not going to dig into that. So I guess one lesson to draw from all this, from this third general response to the argument from free will, which is that various clarifications to free will can kind of remove its force, and we went through three of those alleged clarifications that remove its force. One thing to draw from all this is that the free will objection to the causal principle is really tricky, and responses to it might involve incurring impalatable costs. Right, so I, what about a fourth response to the argument? So the fourth response to the free will objection to the causal principle is that the defender of both free will and the causal principle can simply adopt a version of compatibilism about free will. According to this version, or better, family of versions of compatibilism, one, we have free will, two, causal determinism is compatible with our having free will, and three, free will doesn't require us to be the ultimate originators or sources of our actions in a way that requires the causal buck to stop with us. Instead, we can be deterministically caused to act and decide by factors beyond our control, and yet still exert control over and incur responsibility for our actions and decisions. And note that this isn't some ludicrous fringe view. In fact, most philosophers are compatibilists, as revealed by the 2020 Phil Paper survey. Right, a lot of them think that, like, so long as you're, say, appropriately reasons responsive in acting, so long as your faculties are in good working order, perhaps so long as your first order desires for action and your second order desires about how your first order desires lead to action, perhaps there's an appropriate correspondence or mesh or harmony between them. If some or all of these conditions are met, they're going to say you're totally responsible for what you've done, even if you live in a causally deterministic world. And in that case, you could totally happily have free will and also causal determinism and everything that begins to exist as a cause, including every event, so including every decision, every action, even every agent causing of every decision and action, you could still have all that requiring a cause, and so still preserve the causal principle. And you can have a happy marriage. Alas, though, the marriage may not be as happy as it seems. So there are some lingering worries, in other words. For there are some serious challenges to compatibilism, such as manipulation arguments, 
right? Intuitively, an agent that is like severely manipulated by, let's say, a neuroscientist who implanted something in their brain, a manipulated agent doesn't seem to act freely. And yet it turns out to be pretty hard to pinpoint a relevant difference between a manipulated agent and an agent in a causally deterministic world. Moreover, compatibilism may introduce special difficulties for the theist in particular. For example, if compatibilism is true, well then we could all have been free and responsible despite being determined to always do the good. And so the problem of evil might become considerably harder to solve. Anyway, we're not going to go into all that here since it extends far beyond the scope of this video. I just wanted to make you aware that this response to the free will objection isn't without its challenges. And note too that adopting compatibilism as a response to the free will objection will considerably diminish the appeal of the Kalam, since the Kalam would then require a controversial view in another area of philosophy, with its own dialectic and its own challenges and objections. And in general, just the more auxiliary hypotheses you add, the less likely your case is to succeed. <laughs> All right, so the fifth and final response to the free will objection involves reformulating the Kalam so as to avoid altogether issues pertaining to free will and causation. The reformulation runs as follows. One, whatever begins to exist has something explanatorily prior to it. Two, the universe began to exist. So the universe has something explanatorily prior to it. Now, if X has something explanatorily prior to it, then there is some Y that at least partly explains why X exists or occurs. Now. Note that explanatory priority doesn't necessarily imply temporal priority. So for instance, imagine that the Earth has existed from eternity past, and imagine further that a boulder has, from eternity past, cast an impression on the sand underneath it. Here, the boulder's weight is responsible for the existence and character of the impression on the sand. And yet, neither the boulder nor its weight are temporally prior to the impression on the sand. Uh, similarly, my neural structures exist in part because various fundamental physical particles are arranged a certain way. Here, the explanation of higher-level phenomena is in terms of lower-level phenomena, where the latter don't temporarily precede the former. Right? Note that we're talking about a specific arrangement of physical particles. It's the arrangement that doesn't temporarily precede the existence of my neural structures. Instead, the arrangement constitutes those structures. So anyway, that's a note about what explanatory priority is. Notice, moreover, that premise one, employing this modified principle, this modified explanatory principle, it's not at all incompatible with libertarian free will. Right? Defenders of libertarian free will universally recognize that there are things explanatorily prior to free actions and decisions, such as the agent themselves and the agent's reasons and desires, and the agent's general psychological makeup and dispositions. For the libertarian, none of these things render the agent's decisions and actions inevitable, but nevertheless, it's clear that they at least partly explain why the agent acts and decides as he or she does. Thus, this reformulated version of the Kalam would avoid, so it seems, any tension with free will and would still allow us to infer that something outside the universe explains its beginning. If, of course, the premises are true. Now, one pitfall of this reformulation, among other potential pitfalls that we are not going to be going into, but one potential pitfall of this reformulation of the Kalam is that it might make stage two of the Kalam considerably more difficult to successfully implement. Right? After all, we're not licensed to infer that the relation between the universe's explanands, that is, what explains the universe, so we're not licensed to infer that the relation between what explains the universe and the universe itself is causation. Right, because the conclusion is only getting us to something explanatorily prior to the universe. It doesn't tell us that that explanatory relation is going to be a causal one. And yet, the relation being a causal one was arguably crucial to inferring the agency or personhood of the universe's explanation. Right, at least in its Craigian manifestation, the argument tries to infer a kind of personal agent causal power that produces the universe. And it crucially relies, it seems, on there being a causal relation between the universe's explanations and the universe itself. So once you gut the argument of that, it's no longer clear that we're going to be able to infer the agency or personhood of the universe's explanation. All right, so that's the free will objection to the causal principle. It brings us into lots of very interesting and quite difficult and quite tricky dialectical and conceptual waters. But onwards we march to the conceivability objection, that is to say. So a second argument one might offer against the Kalam's first premise derives from conceivability, or alternatively, imaginability. You can run the argument with either. Roughly, to conceive of something is to flesh out a scenario in one's mind, and, upon examining and reflecting on it, to find it to be without apparent contradiction or unintelligibility or absurdity. It's similar to imaginability. We imagine something when we, as it were, picture it in the mind's eye. We form certain mental images of it. Here, then, is the objection from conceivability. Premise 1, I can conceive of something coming into being without a cause. Premise 2, if I can conceive of X, then X is possible. Premise 3, if the causal principle is true, or at least necessarily true, then something coming into existence without a cause is not possible. 
So, conclusion, the causal principle is not true, or at least not necessarily true. Now, note that the argument can equally be run using imaginability. You just substitute imagine for conceive of. So the first two premises will be, I can imagine something coming into being without a cause. And the second premise is going to be that if I can imagine X, then X is possible. This line of reasoning traces back at least to David Hume, who defended it in the first book of his Treatise of Human Nature. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I'll hereafter simply talk of conceivability, but what I say equally applies with appropriate modifications to the imaginability version. So up next are two responses to the argument from conceivability. No doubt there are more potential responses, but again, I can't hope to be totally comprehensive in this video. It's already going to be many hours long. So the first response is that premise two, as stated, is false. Conceivability doesn't imply possibility. After all, I can conceive of numbers existing, but I can also conceive of them not existing. It's not as though, like, nominalism is inconceivable. It's also not as though, like, realism about numbers is inconceivable, whether of an Aristotelian or Platonic variety or some other variety that people find acceptable. I can also arguably conceive of God existing, but I can also conceive of God not existing. It's not as though, like, Oppie's naturalism is utterly inconceivable, or like Felipe Leon's liberal naturalism is utterly inconceivable, or like certain Eastern religious views are utterly inconceivable, and so on. And yet, right, numbers either must exist or cannot exist, right? Numbers wouldn't just be like contingent beings that just like happen to exist, or that, you know, exist on Tuesdays, not on Wednesdays. No, if, if there are such things as numbers, then they're going to necessarily exist. There are going to be certain necessary truths about them, such as that one plus one equals two. That's not just like contingently true. It's going to be true in every possible world. God, moreover, since he's defined as a necessary being either must exist or cannot exist, and so on. So at least in some of these cases, we are conceiving of a state of affairs or a scenario or the truth of some proposition, even though that state of affairs or that scenario or that being or that proposition is not even possibly true. And so conceivability doesn't entail possibility. That's the general thrust of this response. Now, to avoid this problem, the proponent of the argument from conceivability can modify premise 2 to say that conceivability, while it may not imply or entail possibility, at least provides defeasible evidence for possibility, where evidence is defeasible when the support that it provides can be overridden or undermined by countervailing considerations. If we take this defeasible version of premise 2 together with premise 1, we would then have reason, albeit defeasible reason, to think that the causal principle is false. And whether or not this reason is defeated depends, of course, on how strong the arguments in favor of the causal principle are. Uh, even still, though, if both premises are true, then we do have at least some reason to think the causal principle is false, and it's going to have to weigh on our evidential scales. It should be noted, though, that at least some philosophers are skeptical that conceivability even provides defeasible evidence for possibility. Uh, conceivability, one might think, has a pretty bad track record, and it might strike one as way too freewheeling to be a good guide to possibility. For a survey of the reasons that some philosophers reject the evidential salience of conceivability, at least in contexts far removed from our ordinary experience, I highly recommend checking out pages 24 to 29 of Philippe Leon's contribution to the book Is God the Best Explanation of Things? A Dialogue that is co-authored with Josh Rasmussen. And it's an excellent book, by the way, so just pick up the book and read it. All right, so that's the first response to the argument. It's basically to say, hey, you need to defeasibilize this premise. You need to make it defeasible. You need to say, no, conceivability doesn't entail possibility, doesn't imply possibility, but it at least provides defeasible evidence for possibility, so the thought goes. And then I just noted that, well, at least some philosophers even challenged that, at least in contexts far removed from ordinary experience, which arguably this is going to be one of those cases. All right, the second response to the conceivability argument is what we could call a symmetry problem. So you know, yeah, the second problem says that the appeal to conceivability cuts both ways. For, one might think, that I can also conceive of the causal principle being true. Indeed, I can conceive of it being essential to beginnings that they require causes. And from this it follows, perhaps defeasibly, that it's possible that beginnings essentially require causes. This in turn implies that, possibly, it is necessary that beginnings have causes. Given a standard system of modal logic, modal logic is the study of valid inferences concerning possibility and necessity, by the way, and that standard system is, of course, system S5, not universally granted by philosophers, but it's probably the most widely accepted one. Anyway, given a standard system of modal logic, whatever is possibly necessary is necessary full stop. And, of course, whatever is necessary is actual. And so conceivability equally supports or justifies the actual truth of the causal principle. And in that case, the original evidential force of being able to conceive of uncaused beginnings is canceled out. Right, conceivability in that case might provide defeasible support to the possibility of uncaused beginnings, but now we've just had equally plausible symmetric support for the impossibility of uncaused beginnings on the basis of conceivability. So the appeals to conceivability are kind of awash. Note, though, that this response may have problems. 
You can see uh, David Wielace's points in response to a similar point that I brought up at minute mark 5510 in my discussion with him. For example, one could restrict the conceivability to possibility principle to non-modal claims, and this would avoid the above symmetry criticism, since the relevant claim about the essence of beginnings is modal in character. Or one might challenge whether this essence claim is conceivable in the first place. Are you really able to, like, phenomenologically distinguish conceiving of all beginnings having causes from all beginnings essentially having causes? It's like, what's the difference in your phenomenology there? Like, what's the difference in your experiences there? Like, in what's going on in your mind? Actually, as it happens, some people have also challenged whether an uncaused beginning is even conceivable. For example, it's one thing to conceive of a beginning without also conceiving of something that caused it, but it's another thing entirely to conceive of a beginning that doesn't have a cause. Moreover, one might be skeptical about our ability to rule out, in our conceived-of situation, that there are causes of the beginning of which we aren't aware. Of course, one could simply stipulate that there are no such causes, but the conceivability-to-possibility link may not hold for mere stipulates about conceived-of situations. And, furthermore, one could also simply stipulate that, in a conceived-of scenario, beginnings essentially require causes, and symmetry may then re-arise. So there are lots of thorny, tricky philosophical issues here. Philosophy is tough, right? As I hope is becoming clear, adequately assessing the Kalam's causal principle is extremely difficult and requires significant philosophical work. Too often, I think, proponents of the argument paper over this complexity and paint the principle as, like, self-evident and undeniable. But as you can see, things are much more gray than black and white here. Also, bear in mind that my goal throughout this video is really to equip you with the tools to think critically about the Kalam's causal principle for yourself. I'm not mounting a single-sided polemic for or against the principle. Rather, I'm trying to philosophically explore its merits and demerits, and help you navigate the tricky issues that it raises. So, a third reason one might offer against the causal principle is that it's simply refuted by quantum mechanics. According to this line of thinking, on the subatomic level, so-called virtual particles come into existence uncaused. Similarly, certain cosmogonic models are interpreted as showing that the universe could have come into existence uncaused from a quantum vacuum. Likewise, it's said that the radioactive decay of atomic nuclei occurs without a cause. It just happens, spontaneously, without anything making it happen or bringing it about. More conservatively, the objection at hand can be run as an undercutting defeater. Unlike rebutting defeaters, which show that a claim is actually or probably false, undercutting defeaters simply show that a claim is inadequately justified. They remove one's grounds for accepting the claim. If we run the objection at hand as an undercutting defeater, then it would essentially run as follows. The interpretations of quantum phenomena, in which some such phenomena are uncaused, are live, empirically open options. And the proponent of the causal principle would need to give us some reason to think that such interpretations are false if they want us to accept the causal principle. Without giving such reasons, the principle is simply inadequately motivated, since it assumes, without adequate justification, the falsity of such interpretations. Now, several things might be said in response to this objection to the causal principle. First, one might respond by noting, quite rightly, that it's quite disputed in physics whether virtual particles actually exist. This response, however, won't target the undercutting defeater version of the objection, since the undercutting defeater version emphasizes that the onus is on the proponent of the causal principle to positively rule out the interpretations on which some quantum phenomena are uncaused. It won't do merely to suggest that such interpretations are controversial. We need to be given some reason to think that they're false. We need to be given some positive reason to think that they're false. Second, one might respond that these allegedly uncaused quantum events simply don't have deterministic causes. But it's an entirely separate question whether they have indeterministic causes. And, indeed, we may have good reason to think that they do. As Craig notes, virtual particles, if they exist, and other quantum particles, arise as spontaneous fluctuations of the energy contained in the subatomic vacuum, which constitutes an indeterministic cause of their origination. And the same point can be made about theories of the origin of the universe out of a primordial vacuum, which is not nothing but instead a sea of fluctuating energy endowed with a rich structure and subject to physical laws. Rob Coons likewise notes that the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the one which allegedly delivers uncaused events, doesn't after all entail that quantum phenomena are uncaused. According to the Copenhagen version of quantum mechanics, Coons writes, every transition of a system has causal antecedents. The preceding quantum wave state in the case of Schrodinger evolution, or the preceding quantum wave state plus the observation in the case of wave packet collapse. Graham Abbey generally concurs with these observations. As he writes, some say that there are quantum cases in which things pop into existence without any prior cause. However, the quantum cases are of two kinds. On the one hand, there are cases in which real particles come into existence as a result of indeterministic causal processes. In these kinds of cases, it is not true that the particles come into existence without any cause. 
Rather, all that is true is that the particles come into existence as a result of merely probabilistic causes. On the other hand, there are cases in which it is said that virtual particles come into existence without any cause whatsoever. Here, there may be some division of opinion. Those who think that virtual particles are real assimilate this case to the first. Virtual particles have probabilistic causes of their coming into existence, and so do not pop into existence, as it were, without any cause. But others deny that virtual particles are real. On this view, virtual particles are mere mathematical artifacts that facilitate calculation of the properties of real particles. Either way, quantum cases provide no support for the claim that there are things that pop into existence, as it were, without any prior cause. Indeed, one might think that the very fact that we can assign precise, determinate probabilities to quantum phenomena and study them scientifically seems to imply that there's a kind of intelligibility, order, and regularity here. In other words, the quantum phenomena don't behave in an utterly inexplicable fashion. They're explained, albeit indeterministically, by antecedent factors. Though, of course, keep in mind that one might argue that they're explained simply by laws and not by causes, but set that aside. The same is true of radioactive decay. As American astronomer W.R. Stoger notes, we have good reason for thinking that radioactive decay and the statistics it exhibits have underlying proportionate causal explanations, since they exhibit regularities strongly indicative of more fundamental ordered causes. And as physicist Peter... Bussy? Busse? Busse. We're, we're going to go with Busse. As Peter Busse points out, beta decay is due to the so called weak nuclear force, in whose absence the decay would not occur. So the cause of the new nuclear state is the weak force acting on the previous nuclear state. A third response one might level to the objection from quantum mechanics to the Coulomb's causal principle is that even if the Copenhagen interpretation implies that some quantum events are uncaused, there are other interpretations of quantum mechanics that are causally deterministic and that are entirely consistent with the empirical evidence. As Craig and Sinclair write, a great many physicists today are quite dissatisfied with the traditional Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, and are exploring deterministic theories like that of David Bohm and I add Hugh Everett. Indeed, most of the available interpretations of the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics are fully deterministic. Quantum cosmologists are especially averse to Copenhagen, since that interpretation in a cosmological context will require an ultramundane observer to collapse the wave function of the universe. Now, keep in mind that it would be significant if the Kalam required a deterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, each interpretation is quite controversial and contested by experts in the field, and so the Kalam would be considerably weakened if it had to take a stance on such a matter. Keep in mind, though, that this third response is assuming, as perhaps we shouldn't, that the Copenhagen interpretation implies that some quantum events are uncaused. Now, one important difficulty afflicting Craig's move here is that, at least in several prominent non-Copenhagen interpretations of quantum mechanics, many physicists and philosophers argue that causation is absent altogether. And furthermore, there are serious challenges to Craig's preferred non-Copenhagen interpretation. Craig insists that because his favorite model of quantum mechanics, de Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory, is deterministic, there's no proven counterexample to the causal principle. But just as Craig can find critics of bouncing cosmology, it's not hard to find critics of the pilot wave theory who feel there's way too high a price to pay to accept this framework. Uh, one of the prices is non-locality, as we see in EPR, uh, violation of bell inequalities, but another price and it's a huge price, is we, we've really lost most of particle physics. We, we've even lost ordinary quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, um, in its coupling with radiation, without which we wouldn't have any experimental access at all to the micro world. So there's a big problem going to pilot wave theory. The motivation seems wrong, what it delivers isn't enough, it gives you something you don't want, namely the non-locality. To my understanding, it um, is not really a well-developed theory. There's a kind of asymmetry in the dialectic here. So on the one hand, Craig says that he can appeal to de Broglie-Bohm theory as an example of a deterministic theory without committing to the truth of de Broglie-Bohm theory, while at the same time demanding of his interlocutors that they show him what the correct theory of an infinite past would be. But his interlocutors don't need to do that. All his interlocutors need to do is to show that it's at least a live possibility. It's at least possible for all we know that the past is infinite. It seems then that whatever interpretation of quantum mechanics you pick, there's going to be some violation of our basic intuitions, whether it's a loss of determinism, locality, or uniqueness. But there's a more fundamental problem that is not related to how we interpret quantum mechanics. We can distinguish between gnomic determinism and causal determinism. Gnomic determinism is the view that everything is determined by physical law, 
Causal determinism is the view that all events are determined by prior causes. It could be false that all events are determined by prior causes, even though it's true that all events are determined by the laws of nature. You don't need an interpretation of quantum mechanics in which you have the spontaneous and random collapse of the wave function in order to say that causation is not a part of quantum mechanics. The sure, absence of causality does not rely on the, which interpretation um, of quantum mechanics one uses. First, because even if you uh, uh, adhere and, and take seriously one of the deterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics, and there are, uh, many world is a deterministic interpretation, and uh, uh, Bohmian mechanics is a deterministic interpretation. Is in that case, um, people who adhere to that don't think in terms of causes, they think in terms of regularity. Uh, it's very different. Anyway, the issues here are difficult, and they quickly spiral into extremely technical territory. All in all, I think a degree of epistemic humility on each side of the dialectic is called for here. All right, on to the next argument against the causal principle. So a fourth consideration one might raise against the Coulomb's causal principle is that beginnings of existence only require explanations, not necessarily causes. Note that not all explanations are causal explanations. One example is me unwittingly losing a bet that I could pick eight people at random, none of whom were born on the same day of the week. My losing the bet is non-causally explained by the mathematical fact that you can't match up eight birthdays with seven days without at least two birthdays falling on the same day. And this, by the way, is called the pigeonhole principle. You can see this excellent video here for an explanation of the pigeonhole principle and how it can offer an explanation of a really cool fact about the number of hairs on people's bodies. It's actually pretty interesting. Still, other non-causal explanations involve functional realization, grounding, metaphysical necessity. So, for example, part of the explanation for why my computer is running a word processing program is that it has hardware that functionally realizes it, that is, performs the relevant rules and instructions specified by the program. And the value of money is grounded in our collective attitudes and practices. It's not like our attitudes causally produce the value, it's just that its value is constituted by and explained in terms of our collective attitudes and practices. Finally, many theists think that God's existence is non-causally explained in terms of the metaphysical necessity of God's existence, or equivalently, the metaphysical impossibility of God's non-existence. And actually see the supplementary sections on the MTA that are available for patrons in this document for more examples of non-causal explanation. Also note that Orthodox Christians, I think, have to believe in non-causal explanations, since the Son is generated by the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and perhaps also the Son, which means that the Son and Spirit are in some manner explanatorily dependent on the Father. And yet, surely the Son and the Spirit aren't efficiently caused to exist, for then they would be created things. But, crucially, once we admit non-causal explanations into the picture, it's not at all clear why everything that begins to exist requires a specifically causal explanation rather than merely requiring an explanation, whether causal or non-causal. Almost all, if not all of the reasons favoring the cause-based principle equally favor the explanation-based principle. And so it would seem that there's no non-arbitrary way to prefer the cause-based principle over the principle cast merely in terms of explanation. And if that's right, we shouldn't accept the Kalam's first premise. Instead, we should only be willing to accept that every beginning has an explanation, whether causal or non-causal. Why is this significant, you ask? Well, because even if we grant that the universe began to exist, we cannot infer that there is a cause of the universe using the explanation-based principle. Instead, the explanation of the beginning of the universe might be in terms of a functional realizer, or in terms of a ground, or in terms of the metaphysical necessity of a beginning to the universe. And at least for that last candidate explanation, we aren't even allowed to infer that there is anything beyond the universe. And this, it should be noted, is Graham Oppie's favored view, so it's not like it's outside the bounds of serious, reflective, well-informed, and honest inquiry. It should be clear, then, how this fourth consideration could, in principle, do significant damage to the Kalam. And moreover, even in the cases of a functional realizer or a ground or any other sort of non-causal explanation of the beginning of the universe, if the relation there isn't causal, then, as I explained earlier on in this video, that may very well significantly hamper stage two of the Kalam, and in particular, its attempt to infer the personhood or free will of the cause of the universe. So this point will also arguably seriously hamper stage two of the Kalam. Alright, so how might the defender of the causal principle respond to this overarching worry? Well, I think there are two ways they could go. First, they could try to give some reason why a specifically causal explanation is needed for beginnings. 
Second, they could provide some reason why either, one, the beginning of the universe couldn't, in principle, be metaphysically necessary, and keep in mind that beginning to exist doesn't entail contingency, right? In principle, something might begin to exist in every possible world, and so exist in every possible world, and so exist necessarily. Or, two, that even if the beginning of the universe could be metaphysically necessary, its necessity wouldn't explain, or at least wouldn't adequately explain, its beginning. Or three, that even if its metaphysical necessity would adequately explain its beginning, there are superior explanations available that cite the existence of something beyond the universe. And keep in mind that these points would only address this point about metaphysical necessity. They wouldn't actually address the point about functional realization or grounding or some other non-causal explanatory relation. And as I argued, these kinds of non-causal explanations may indeed seriously hamper stage two of the Kalam. So furthermore, if the defender of the Kalam wants to mount a stage two case, they either need to explain why those non-causal explanations don't, after all, do any damage to stage two of the Kalam, or, if they're not going to go down that route, they're going to need to give us some reason why either, one, the beginning of the universe couldn't, in principle, be explained in those manners, and instead would have to be explained causally, or else, two, that even if the beginning of the universe could be explained in those manners, there are superior explanations available that cite the existence of a cause of the universe specifically, so the relation is specifically causal. Now, exploring candidate reasons along all of these lines extends well beyond my video's scope, but suffice it to note that the onus is on the proponent of the Kalam to offer such reasons. And as far as I'm aware, no one has yet successfully met that burden. Now let's turn then to the final argument against the causal principle that I will consider, and this is Adolf Grunbaum's argument. So yeah, the, the final argument derives from philosopher Adolf Grunbaum. <laughs> I don't know why I'm pronouncing it like that. It's, I think it's because that's how I, I've heard William Lane Craig pronounce it. Space lasts, time lasts, immaterial, enormously powerful, major, pleasure, al Ghazali, Grunbaum. <laughs> okay, anyway, Adolf Grunbaum. So suppose, along with defenders of the Kalan, that there is a first event. Now, the cause of this event couldn't be after the first event, since there being things after the first event depends on there being a first event. And so we would get a vicious circle of dependence if we supposed that the first event depended on a later event. But nor could the cause have been before the first event, since then there would be an event before the first event, which is clearly absurd, right? It wouldn't then be the first event, that is, an event before which there is no other event. And if the cause is simultaneous with the first event, then the cause itself began to exist, and so would itself require a further cause. And clearly we can't keep on postulating an infinity of simultaneous causes, since one, that would entail an actual infinity, contrary to prominent philosophical arguments for the old Kalam's second premise, two, it would also entail an infinite regress of causes, contrary to the new Kalam's insistence on causal finitism, and three, the whole infinitude of simultaneous causes would itself begin to exist, and so itself require a cause, per the Kalam's causal principle. Thus, given the causal principle, ultimately one cannot avoid a non-simultaneous cause of the first event. But if the cause isn't simultaneous with the first event, then it's surely either before or after it. And we've already seen why it can be neither before nor after it. Hence, the first event cannot have a cause. So, if there's a first event, as defenders of the Kalam themselves grant, the causal principle is false. Alright, so that's the argument. Now let's look at some responses. So the first response to this argument is that it neglects that the cause might, in principle, be neither before, nor after, nor simultaneous with the first event. It might instead simply be timeless. Of course, one might object to the notion of timeless to temporal causation, but then one would be mounting a different objection than Grunbaum's. Nevertheless, this reply does spawn a bonus argument against the causal principle. One, there is a first event, granted by proponents of the Klam. Two, if the causal principle is true, and there is a first event, then that first event has a cause. Three, if that first event has a cause, that cause is timeless, in which case there is timeless to temporal causation. And this is granted by this first response to Grunbaum's argument. Four, but there is no timeless to temporal causation. Right Earlier in this video, I discussed intuitive, inductive, and explanatory reasons for accepting this premise. Of course, it's a controversial premise, and no one is claiming that it's utterly rationally compelling to all rational individuals. But from those four, it would follow that the causal principle is false. This argument is definitely something to chew on for all y'all. Anyway, back to the responses to Grunbaum's argument. The second response to Grunbaum's argument that I'll consider, which incidentally is also a response to the third premise in the bonus argument just considered. So the response is that the cause of the first event could, in principle, be before the first event, so long as the cause isn't itself an event. The cause could perhaps be a substance or a state. This substance or state could exist in a non-metric or metrically amorphous or metrically undifferentiated time prior to the beginning of metric time and the first event. 
Of course, one might object to the notion of substance to event causation, or to state to event causation, or to the notion of non-metric, amorphous, undifferentiated time. In fact, there are several philosophical challenges to these ideas. But first, I don't have the time to get into those. <laughs> and second, if one wants to mount these challenges, one would essentially be mounting a different objection than Grunbaum's. And so one would be conceding that Grunbaum's argument by itself isn't enough to refute the causal principle. All right, so now let's get into a summary of the arguments against the causal principle. I think we went through six such arguments. So according to the reverse argument from intuition, the intuitive falsity of the causal principle justifies its denial. Now, this argument will need to address the responses to the argument from intuition for the causal principle that I covered earlier in the video. It also needs to contend with the fact that lots of people intuit the truth of the causal principle, just as the argument from intuition for the causal principle needs to contend with the fact that many people intuit its falsity. And finally, it's unclear whether those who claim to intuit the possibility of uncaused beginnings actually intuit as much, as opposed to simply not intuiting the impossibility of uncaused beginnings. Next, according to the free will argument, the causal principle is incompatible with free will. The argument consisted of two challenges, or maybe two sub-arguments. First, the causal principle seems incompatible with free will because it seems to imply that we're not the ultimate sources of our actions. And second, the causal principle seems incompatible with specifically libertarian free will because it seems to imply causal determinism, the thesis that every event is the inevitable consequence of prior causal conditions. I then examined five responses to the argument from free will. First, the causal principle just doesn't entail causal determinism. It's perfectly compatible with indeterministic causation, for instance. So that targets the second sub-argument, or the second challenge here. Secondly, the causal principle can be restricted to objects. Although I argued that this response was seriously flawed. Third, clarifications on free will, one might think, render the challenge moot. Now, these clarifications, though, may face serious difficulties of their own. I gave a little bit of a survey of some of those. Fourth, one could adopt compatibilism in response. This too might raise serious difficulties, and it also considerably diminishes the appeal of the Kalam, insofar as it would require a controversial view in another area of philosophy. And fifth, one could modify the principle to avert the challenges, right? The, the modified principle was just in terms of explanation rather than causation. And in particular, it said that everything that begins to exist has something which is explanatorily prior to it. And proponents of free will and also libertarian free will can perfectly accept that principle. I noted, though, that that principle might seriously hamper stage two of the Kalam. The next argument against the causal principle was that uncaused beginnings are eminently conceivable. They're also eminently imaginable, and that this implies that they're possible, contra the causal principle. I then examined two responses to this third argument. That should not say second, that should say third. First, conceivability arguably doesn't imply possibility. At best, it only offers defeasible evidence thereof. And even that is controversial in at least some philosophical circles. Still, though, it's worth noting that if we grant this, and if we grant that uncaused beginnings really are conceivable, or really are imaginable, then we're going to at least have some significant reason to think that the causal principle is false. A second response to this argument is that conceivability might cut both ways, right? The necessary truth of the causal principle might itself be conceivable, or it might itself be conceivable or imaginable that beginnings essentially require causes. And so conceivability might equally support the causal principle's possible necessary truth, and hence, given system S5 of modal logic, its necessary truth simpliciter. There are, however, some challenges to this second response, and I also noted that a third response that one could mount to this conceivability argument, and that some have actually mounted against it, is that uncaused beginnings actually aren't conceivable after all. They simply aren't imaginable after all. So that's another way one might go. And there's an ensuing dialectic on that point, too. All right, the quantum mechanical argument against the causal principle. According to that argument, quantum mechanics furnishes various counterexamples to the causal principle, pertaining to things like virtual particles, radioactive decay, perhaps the universe's ability to, as it were, tunnel into existence spontaneously and allegedly uncausedly, etc. I then looked at three responses to this argument. First, whether some of those phenomena are real is controversial. Although note that you can put this argument in terms of an undercutting defeater, in which case just noting that the, whether those phenomena are real is controversial, that's not going to do it. The defender of the Kalam is actually going to need to give some positive reason to think that they're not real. If, of course, they want to go down this first route of response, and if, of course, we're construing the objection as an undercutting defeater. The second response was that those quantum phenomena simply have indeterministic or probabilistic causes, right? Their randomness doesn't translate into being uncaused. They are caused, it's just they're caused indeterministically or probabilistically, so this second response says. The third response is that there are other empirically equivalent deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics. Alas, these interpretations face problems of their own and also might challenge the causal principle on different fronts. The next argument against the causal principle is that the principle mistakenly demands specifically causes of beginnings rather than the mere explanations of beginnings. But once we adopt the explanation-based principle, 
we can no longer infer something transcending the universe that brought about the universe. And furthermore, even if we could infer something outside the universe, the relation between that thing and the universe may very well be non-causal. It would still be explanatory in nature, but it may very well be non-causal. And, as explained earlier, that might significantly hamper the second stage of the Kalam. I then briefly mentioned three ways that the proponent of the causal principle might respond without pursuing them in depth. Finally, I examined Grunbaum's argument that the causal principle is false because the first event, if there is one, as Kalam proponents will grant, began and yet it cannot have a cause, since nothing before, after, or simultaneous with it could cause it. The two responses to Grunbaum's argument that I considered were as follows. First, the argument neglects timeless to temporal causation, and second, it neglects a view on which an amorphous or non-metric time precedes metric time, and from within which a substance or state causes the first event. I also briefly highlighted another bonus argument against the causal principle, which grants the Kalam's commitment to a first event, but concludes that such a first event has no cause, because otherwise we would land in the absurdity of timeless to temporal causation. If the argument succeeds, it shows that the causal principle is false, and whether it succeeds is a question for you to judge. And finally, I have here a reference document that patrons can click on and see and access a lot of the different resources that I've drawn on in developing, assessing, and evaluating these arguments against the causal principle. All right, well, on to the conclusion. So overall, the causal principle is a fascinating topic for philosophical study. There are several arguments in its favor, but also several arguments against it. Whether you should accept it will probably depend on your unique position in the grand epistemic landscape. It's going to depend on a lot of different judgment calls. It's going to depend on your background philosophical positions, perhaps about conceivability, perhaps about quantum mechanics, perhaps about free will, and perhaps about the nature and justification conferring status of intuitions, and so on. Like whether one should accept this causal principle depends on so many different factors that are going to be highly individual specific. I think we should repudiate then simple appeals that the principle is like undeniable or self-evident or that one must be irrational in denying it. And we should also repudiate claims that the principle is obviously false or that the principle cannot be rationally accepted. Whether something is rationally accepted depends, as I've hoped to show throughout this entire document, it depends on a whole concoction of factors. A slew of background philosophical views affect the plausibility and viability and tenability of the causal principle, and this holds more generally. And this is why justification is very often person-specific. It's going to depend on what your intuitions are, what you think intuitions are, and their justification-conferring status. It'll depend on whole concoctions of factors that are going to be individual-specific. I also want to note in concluding that if you enjoyed this video, and if you see value in the work that I do, and hey, let's face it, if you got to this point in the video, you probably do see value in the work that I do, please consider becoming a patron or making a one-time donation. Links to those are in the description. You can think of a one-time donation like a tip, right? You tip waiters, don't you, right? Right, when you go out to eat, a waiter gives you some extra breadsticks and whatnot, and you tip them for that, and the waiter is getting paid for what they're doing. I'm not getting paid for what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm just making this channel and trying to serve people. So this isn't like a job that I'm getting paid for, unlike waiters. And Unlike waiters who are just bringing you some extra breadsticks, I'm trying to help you get to the fundamental nature of reality. And unlike a waiter, I had to spend dozens upon dozens upon dozens of hours researching for this video and putting it together so that I can serve you guys. So anyway, if you tip waiters, I think you should tip me too. But of course, I would say that because I'm immensely biased. And also, I'm not just saying that because, oh, I love money or anything like that. I'm going to be a grad student very soon. And, and living the grad student life is, well, you're kind of scraping by. So anyway, thank you for even considering these sorts of things. And I also want to once more highlight my Kalam playlist. I highly recommend you guys to check that out. If, again, if you watched this video and you appreciate it, and if you enjoyed it, you're really going to like that Kalam playlist. And the final note here is that if you enjoy this video and if you know someone else who likes the Kalam and they like the Kalam's causal principle, I highly, highly recommend sharing this video with them so that they can open their eyes to the fascinating complexities underlying the Kalam's causal principle. Whether they accept it or deny it, I think they'll find a lot in this video that will serve them in their pursuit of truth. Anyway, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is the Majesty of Reason, and peace out.